here. <clears throat> Good morning, Canada. So basically, we have um, the Conservatives, they have a motion today, um, and then they're going to be calling another motion on, the, on Thursday, I believe it'll be tomorrow, um, a vote of no confidence in the government over the carbon tax. And in the description is the one they're going to be doing, discussing today. And and like you said, 70% of Canadians don't want to see the carbon tax increase. And um, the premiers as well. Like it's 7 out of 11, 7-11 or something like that, that are basically saying, it's got to go. Well, I think um, communication, the, the liberals and the pundits of the left are all saying, well, it's communications. Well, yeah, you called it carbon tax. You can't call anything a tax. You know, GST. Why do they call it GST? Because they had to hide the fact that there was a, that T word in the end of it. Basically, um, they didn't. They put it front and center. They should have called it CT or CTR or whatever. They just called it carbon tax. And, and basically... Um, well, this is the gist of it. Like it or not, the government's um, financial uh, situation is not in order. It's kind of like mine. I got, except I got only one hundred and fifty dollars paid last month. They get whatever the hell they want for loans. I get denied. They they get all kinds of money to spend on all kinds of bureaucratic bullshit stuff. The plebs they get voted down. Well, you know. Your neighbor gets his 14th house to buy. <laughs> this is the economy we're in. Basically, the reason that the, the... But the thing is, is the government is not breaking in enough money. We have to increase industry, which will harm the environment, right? Um, but that needs to be done to, to pay the bills. Like it or not, um, the liberals don't... They have a new vision. I don't know what it is because even to make the green products of the world, we have to like get, you know, rare earths. And, and that, you know, yes, we do it the cleanest and we do it the best in Canada um, compared to anyone else in the world. But it's still it's still messy, right? I think more we should be focused on um, legacy funds, making them pay into a legacy fund. Basically for the cleanup. And then you give that money when the project is over because mining is cyclical, right? It's up and down. And then you give that money to all the Greenpeace people who are protesting and picketing at the gate of every mine at the end of the cyclical mine. Because when it starts slowing down, it winds down. So say, we'll just use it by people. It has a thousand people. Keep those freaking Greenpeace people outside the gate. They pay into a fund as they make money. And as the money is over, or, or uh, as the mine winds down to, say, 100 workers, then let the Greenpeace workers in and pay them out of that legacy fund that is attributed to, you know, but, but from the taxes that the company pays. And that way, I think, is the only way because it's, it has to be done personally. It has to be done if you want to have a cleaner, greener thing. And remember, once we get these materials into our... Uh, you know, the reuse, recycle thing, right? Right, that the arrow thing, they kind of get, you know, recycled. It's a big circle fund. Um, and, and you only have to increase like 20% a year. So so we just need to get the stuff into our supply chains and then we'll figure out better ways to, to keep it, you know, recycle. Anyway, the problem is the government needs money. <laughs> they have a carbon tax. Okay, uh, the, the this is the thing that makes no sense. All the, the, the a, a couple pundits were saying, well, it only increases this much, and you'll get it back, but it doesn't include the cost on everything. Every business has an increased cost in their heating because we are in Canada. All of them have an increased heating cost. All of them have an increased cost in in travel. So there's there's a huge increase that's not included. In the rebate. So we're not getting the, the Canadians are not getting the money back. There's no way that's actually happening. Though the government needs to increase income. <laughs> so it's a double whammy, right? Um, but no one wants to see this. I don't think anyone, 70% of Canadians, this is like, it's, on, this is um, a push for the, the tax. It's not like the GST. It's not very modern, I would say, because, um, like one good pundit said was, there's no alternative. Like, okay, uh, I can't afford an electric car. 
Um, so, <laughs> and there, no bank's going to give us a loan to get my electric car. So you're just beating me for driving. <laughs> you know, you're beating me because we can't fly our food to our, our, our homes. Um, it, 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 it's not like tractors have an alternative. Uh, oh, it's a, go buy the electric tractor from John Deere. Oh, wait, there isn't one. They don't have the power per square inch uh, in, in it yet. It's not there. We're not there yet. But the, the taxes are as if we are there yet. And you are if you're a millionaire. Um, you can buy all kinds of these nifty products and stuff like that that you'll never return your money back. You'll never. Most of them are gimmicky things um, that doesn't return your money. But if you have money and you want to do good, yeah, fuck, perfect. This is great. But the, 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 <clears throat> this is why it isn't working. Anyway, I'm off. Um, you know, this is one thing I do find funny, but the people who are like, no vaccine, usually the most people that are so vehemently against the vaccines or whatever, I, I personally got them because I wanted to go out and I've smelled some things and I've smoked some things, that cigarettes that probably were toxic. And, and, and what's this, any worse? <laughs> you know, but that's what I find. So these are the people that do a lot of illegal products. And they're the most worried about a government needle. <laughs> I just, I, I personally, you know, well, <clears throat> was it risky? Yeah. So was going outside. Um, I, I, that's my opinion on it. But, but people are still very railing on it. I don't agree that it should have been mandatory. That was kind of, because uh, people were scared. There was uh, honestly a lot of people that were convinced that they were scared. And you're telling them you have to do this. And they're like, no, it's going to kill me. <laughs> You know, um, that's the coercion uh, of someone who's scared. That's actually violence against a person, um, in my opinion. So that's that's totally off. But do your thing. All right. So here we have. All right. So this is going to be this is Pierre Polliver is basically he's going on the the chomp and saying vote of no confidence. And then we're going straight to question period whenever this thing is over. It's about 20 minutes or so. To, uh, to les députés et sénateurs conservateurs et conservatrices qui sont ici, and also, of course, to our friends in the media, our first order of business this morning, in just a moment, will be to welcome our newest colleague and caucus member, Mr. Jamil Javani, MP for the riding of Durham. Calm down, guys. Calm down. He's not coming yet. He's not coming yet. It's a good start, but calm down. Mais d'abord, quelques mots à propos de notre, <laughs> de notre collègue, Jamil Giovanni. A un CV très impressionnant pour un homme de seulement 36 ans. Il est avocat, auteur et communicateur. Il a été élu député. Plutôt ce mois, avec plus de 57% des voix dans la circonscription de Durham, et un quelques faits à propos aux élections partielles dans sa circonscription. Comme j'ai indiqué, il a remporté l'élection partielle de Durham avec 57% des voix. Il s'agit de la plus grande part de voix que le Parti conservateur moderne ait jamais obtenue à Durham. C'est également la plus grande part de voix qu'un euh, qu parti politique et n'importe quel parti est obtenu dans la circonscription de Durham depuis plus qu'un siècle. Et, par contre, le candidat libéral à l'élection partielle a obtenu seulement 22 aux voix des voix, c'est-à-dire la plus faible partie des voix jamais obtenue par le Parti libéral par les libéraux à Durham depuis 2011. Alors, s'il vous plaît, joignez-vous à moi pour souhaiter la bienvenue à notre nouveau collègue, le député de la circonscription de Durham, M. Jamil Giovanni.
Bonjour tout le monde. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Scott. Uh, thank you to each of you for the very warm welcome. I am uh, very proud to be the Common Sense Member of Parliament for Durham. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm very happy to be a member of our Common Sense team uh, as we work very hard for the people of Canada to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming our common sense conservative leader and the next Prime Minister of Canada, Pierre Polyev. <laughs> Merci beaucoup, Jamel. Et merci beaucoup, tout le monde. Merci d'être là. Merci et félicitations à notre, pour notre nouveau collègue de gros bon sens, Jamil Giovanni, euh, sa victoire écrasante. Sa victoire de 58 soi-disant une augmentation de 12 le meilleur résultat pour n'importe quel parti dans ce comté depuis de, de plus de deux décennies. C'est une grande victoire pour lui, pour le Parti conservateur et pour tous les Canadiens qui veulent le gros bon sens. C'est ça. La... Les gens de Durham ont voté pour couper taxes et impôts, bâtir des logements, réparer le budget et stopper les crimes. J'ai eu l'honneur de faire la porte à porte avec notre ami Jamil et de rencontrer des gens dans son comté. Et j'ai vu beaucoup d'espoir de, beaucoup pour l'avenir en même temps que désespoir pour le présent. Parce qu'après huit ans de Justin Trudeau, tout coûte plus cher pour les Canadiens, y compris dans son comté. Le coût de logement a doublé. La criminalité est, est présente partout dans nos rues. Je, je me souviens du camion, camionneur retraité à qui j'ai parlé, qui, la journée même, avait appris qu'il allait perdre sa maison parce qu'il ne pouvait plus payer ses factures. Il avait besoin de demander à sa fille de vivre dans son sous-sol. Il ne savait pas comment il allait payer ses factures, même à ça, parce que le coût de nourriture avait tellement augmenté. Il a 76 ans. Qu'est-ce qu'il peut faire? Est-ce qu'il va aller encore conduire un camion à 76 ans? C'est le type d'horreur que vivent les Canadiens. Ce n'est pas juste euh, des, des plaintes qu'on entend, comme normal en politique. C'est les gens dont les vies sont tout, tout à fait bouleversées. Des jeunes, des, des jeunes femmes qui ne savent pas comment elles auront des enfants parce qu'elles ne peuvent pas acheter une maison et elles vivent dans des petits appartements de 400 pieds carrés. C'est des mères monoparentales qui font le calcul de comment pouvoir nourrir leurs enfants parce qu'après huit ans des taxes et déficits inflationnistes de Trudeau avec l'appui du Bloc, le coût de nourriture a augmenté plus rapidement que dans 40 ans précédents. On voit que maintenant, l'augmentation de 43 dans la demande pour les banques alimentaires après huit ans de Justin Trudeau. Un sur dix Torontois font maintenant recul, recours, excuse-moi, à une banque alimentaire. Un sur dix Torontois. C'est incroyable. Une augmentation de, soit de 600 de demande pour les banques alimentaires à l'Université Western en Ontario. On voit une augmentation aussi grande que même des membres des forces armées 
doivent aller aux banques alimentaires. À Gagetown, là où j'étais, euh, dans la région de Nouveau-Brunswick, il y, y a 50 familles qui doivent aller aux banques alimentaires. À Montréal, la banque alimentaire avait besoin d'appeler les policiers parce qu'il y a eu tellement de chaos au moment que la nourriture était, était épuisée et les gens étaient toujours affamés. On n'a jamais vu ces scènes ici au Canada. Et maintenant, il y a un groupe Facebook de 8 000 personnes qui partagent des suggestions de comment manger d'une poubelle parce qu'il n'y a pas de nourriture abordable à, à l'épicerie et il n'y a plus de nourriture aux banques alimentaires. La criminalité est en hausse. On a perdu 40 000 personnes à cause des drogues. En même temps que Justin Trudeau et le Bloc libèrent les pires criminels et permettent l'entrée des drogues dans nos frontières. Et leur solution, c'est de bannir des armes de chasse des gens dans les régions. Ça, c'est le bilan de Justin Trudeau. Et maintenant, pour les gens dans, la, dans les régions, le, Justin Trudeau et Stephen, Stephen Gilbo veulent bannir des jobs dans le forestier. Ils ont annoncé un décret pour fermer les industries forestières et pour tuer des milliers d'emplois à travers le Québec et partout au Canada. Des gens qui produisent le bois dont on a besoin pour bâtir des logements. C -c ça n'a pas de bon sens, mes chers amis. C'est quoi la solution du Bloc et de Justin Trudeau maintenant à tout cet enfer? Une hausse de taxes. Un grand hausse de taxes sur l'essence qui va coûter... Il y a deux taxes carbone, en fait. La première taxe carbone qui s'applique indirectement au Québec parce que les produits que les Québécois achètent ailleurs au Canada vont être plus chers. Et la deuxième taxe carbone qui s'applique directement au Québec, 17 sous le litre ou 20 sous si on ajoute le taxe de vente sur le taxe de l'essence. Une taxe qui va rendre la vie plus chère pour les Québécois, pour les Acadiens, pour les Franco-Ontariens, pour tous les Canadiens qui vont payer plus cher. Euh, on voit maintenant qu'il n'y a pas de bon sens dans ce gouvernement. Et on voit aussi que le Bloc a appuyé toutes ces politiques économiques de Justin Trudeau. Les hausses de taxes, les hausses de déficit, l'impression d'argent qui a causé, qui a gonflé l'inflation et les taux d'intérêt. La bonne nouvelle, c'est que, que la vie n'était pas comme ça avant Justin Trudeau et ça ne va pas être comme ça après Justin Trudeau. Nous, les conservateurs, nous, dis, euh, nous disons non aux hausses, à, à la hausse de taxes, non à la hausse d'impôts, non à la hausse d'inflation, non à la hausse de dettes. Et c'est pour ça que nous disons aujourd'hui que si Justin Trudeau va de l'avant avec sa, 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 sa prochaine hausse d'impôts, nous, nous allons proposer une motion de non-confiance à la Chambre des communes pour défaire son gouvernement. M. Trudeau, si vous, si vous augmentez encore les taxes et les impôts, nous allons vous défaire avec une motion non-confiance. Il va y avoir une élection sur les taxes et les impôts, dans laquelle le choix sera très clair. Ou bien une coalition coûteuse de Justin Trudeau et le Bloc qui taxe votre nourriture, qui punit votre travail, qui, vous, qui enlève votre argent et qui double le coût de, de logement. Ou bien un gouvernement conservateur de gros bon sens qui, qui va couper taxes et impôts, bâtir des logements, réparer le budget et stopper les crimes. Nous, les conservateurs, avons un plan de gros bon sens. On va éliminer les taxes et déficits inflationnistes pour rendre les prix plus abordables. On va geler les dépenses euh, et couper le gaspillage que Justin Trudeau a fait avec Arrive Scam et d'autres dépenses euh, que le Bloc a appuyées. On va éliminer ce gaspillage pour pouvoir équilibrer le budget et réduire le coût de la vie et les taux d'intérêt. 
On va bâtir des maisons et des appartements en enlevant la bureaucratie pour permettre nos, euh, nos bâtisseurs et nos industries de bâtir des logements que les gens peuvent supporter. On va couper les, les impôts aussi pour que, pour que le travail redevienne payant. Parlant de tra du travail, nous allons mettre en place un saut bleu pour que les Canadiens qui, qui ont été formés ailleurs peuvent devenir des infirmières et des, des, des médecins pour mettre fin à la crise dans notre système de santé. Nous allons euh, stopper les crimes en mettant les vrais criminels en prison, en renforçant nos frontières et pas en, banni, en bannissant les armes de chasse. Ça n'a pas de bon sens. Donc, encore, le Bloc aura la chance de dire s'ils si sont avec les Québécois ou ils sont avec Justin Trudeau. Nous sommes avec les gens du Canada, à partout le Canada, les gens de gros bon sens, qui veulent travailler, qui veulent bâtir leur famille, qui veulent vivre en sécurité. C'est ça, le gros bon sens, et c'est ce que nous allons faire. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Jamil, and congratulations on that spectacular 58% victory, which shows that common sense Canadians in Durham want to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. <laughs> They, uh, I, was, I, I know this because I went door knocking with Jamil, and he wouldn't stop. Even when the lights went out, it was very dark outside. He kept pounding on doors, pounding on doors. They said, Jamil, it's 9.45. You've got to stop knocking on doors. He said, just one more. Lights were out on this house. He bangs the door. The lights go on. Babies start screaming. <laughs> Lady opens the door, and she says, you're in big trouble, sir. I've got triplets that you just woke up, and my husband is a world champion weightlifter. He's, you wait right here. He just wants to come and have a word with you. And Jamil said, that won't be necessary. Just tell him that the local liberal candidate dropped by to say hello. <laughs> A lot of hope among those people in Durham for Jamil for the future, but a lot of uh, a lot of uh, fear and concern about the present. A lot of people feel like they, even though we were on their doorstep, that they were a long way from home. They say they don't recognize the country after eight years of Justin Trudeau, with his inflationary debt and taxes driving up the cost of everything with their f local food banks overflowing, the cost of housing having doubled. I knocked on the door of one 76-year-old ret retired trucker. And he, despite being a big, burly, bearded, strong man, was literally in tears. He had just learned that he was losing his home. He had to call his daughter to ask if he could live in her basement. And even with that change, he wasn't sure how he was going to pay for groceries. So what's he supposed to do? He's 76 years old. He cannot drive a truck. His old back won't take it anymore. What's more, it is fundamentally unjust that a man that drove a truck for a half a century bringing the essentials to our kitchen tables cannot put food on his kitchen table. But that is the tragic reality after eight years of Justin Trudeau and the NDP. Printing $600 billion of cash caused a massive inflationary crisis that continues to this day, a crisis that has driven food prices up faster than at any time in 40 years, that has sent 2 million people every month to a food bank, including 50 at the Gagetown base. 50 members of our armed forces can't feed themselves. One in 10 Tor Torontonians are now going to a food bank. Unimaginable num numbers. Last week, Montreal police had to be called in because people were literally fighting over the scraps of food that were left at one of their food banks. There's been a 600% increase in demand for the University of Western Ontario's food center. Uh, this at a time when scurvy is making a comeback 
because our people cannot afford to feed themselves. With Justin Trudeau and the NDP taxing the farmers who produce the food and the truckers who ship the food and therefore all who buy the food. And then there's housing. After eight years of Trudeau, housing costs have doubled. The rent has doubled, mortgage payments and down payments needed to buy the average home have all doubled. This after he put in place an $89 billion program he said would make housing more affordable. He didn't build homes, he built more bureaucracy. Last year, we built fewer homes in Canada than we did in 1972, even though our population has almost doubled in that, in that same time period. And this is not a global phenomenon. He cannot blame the rest of the world for this hell, this housing hell. This is a homegrown problem. We know that by looking at the facts. Housing costs have grown 40% faster than incomes under Trudeau. That is the second biggest gap of the almost 40 OECD nations. Vancouver is now the third most overpriced housing market in the world, worse than Singapore, a country that is an island with 2,000 times more people per square kilometer than Canada, more expensive than New York City, London, England, and countless other major centers with more people, less land, and more money. After eight years of Justin Trudeau, people are spilling over into tent cities. Halifax now has 30 homeless encampments. Halifax, quaint, beautiful, historical Halifax with homeless people all over the streets. This is a hell we could not have imagined eight years ago. In fact, of all the warnings we made about Justin Trudeau that the media decried as partisanship, we never even came close to claiming he would do the things that he has now in reality done. Right. We were far, far too generous towards him in our interpretation of what would happen to this country under eight years of his socialist NDP policies. And then there's economic growth. We have had the worst economic growth per person in the G7, the worst. In fact, our GDP per person, our income per person in Canada is lower than it was five years ago. That has not happened since the Great Depression, to put it into context. And then crime and chaos, drugs and disorder have been unleashed on our streets with a 100% increase in gang-related homicides, a 100% increase in gun crimes after he targeted the hunting rifles of Grandpa Joe and the sport shooting property of law-abiding uh, uh, sport shooters, he has actually doubled the number of gun crimes. Carjackings up 100%. There's a car stolen every 40 minutes in Toronto. In Toronto alone. Yeah. Cars that are then shipped off to the federally run port, the federally run port, where they're where they are seamlessly put on ships and sent off to the Middle East, to Europe and Africa, so that terrorists and organized criminals can profit from it. He makes these problems worse by wasting our money. Twenty-one billion dollars spent on consultants. That works out to fourteen hundred dollars for every single family in Canada all with the support of the NDP, taking money from working class waitresses and unionized tradesmen to pay two or three thousand dollar a day consultants, the, uh, uh, taking from the have-nots to give to the have yachts, and all with the support of the NDP along the way. And what is their solution now in the midst of all this? Have they finally admitted the damage they've done? Had they stopped the, have they st are they trying to stop and extinguish the fire they started? No. They're pouring more fuel on the inflationary flames with a April Fool's Day carbon tax of 23%. A 23% increase on your gas, your heat, and your groceries. Because if you tax the farmer who makes the food, the trucker who ships the food, you tax all who buy the food. And now we know that it was all a lie. When Trudeau said you get back more in rebates, we have the numbers from the parliamentary budget officers uh, who says, and I quote, this is $2,943 and $43 for the uh, $2,943 for the average Alberta family. That's $900 more than they get back in rebates. Saskatchewan families, on average, $2,618. That's 525 more than they get back in rebates. 
$1,750 for, for Manitoba, $502 more than they get back in rebates. $1,674 for Ontario, that's $627 more than they get back. Nova Scotia, $1,500 more in carbon tax, $1,500 in carbon tax, $500 more than they get back. $1,600 for Prince Edward Island. 500 more than they get back, $1,874 in Newfoundland and Labrador, $377 more than they get back. I go into this painful, excruciating detail to, despu- to debunk the dangerous disinformation mouthed by the Prime Minister oh, yeah. and repeated by the media. Oh, It is dangerous. You say you, you think I'm exaggerating by dangerous? You know what's dangerous? Malnutrition is dangerous. Yes. And when we have a government and, and state-controlled media who are telling people they're getting more than they're paying when exactly the opposite is true, that means people in food banks. That means hungry stomachs uh, in our schools. That means people suffering that shouldn't be. And we need to call out and tell the truth. But we're, we're not going to put up with it anymore. We as common sense conservatives are saying no to Trudeau's 23% April Fool's Day uh, increase. We are saying spike the hike until we common sense conservatives can ax the tax. The good news is... Yeah. The good news is Canadians are good and decent people. They do not have to live like this. They should not have to give up on the things that we all used to take for granted, like affordable food and homes, all for the ego and incompetence of one man. Life was not like this before Justin Trudeau. It will not be like this after he is gone. We're going to replace the hurt he has caused with the hope that Canadians need. So now, today I am announcing that I'm giving Trudeau one last chance to spike his hike. One last chance and only one more day. Today I'm announcing that if Trudeau does not declare today an end to his forthcoming tax increases on food, gas and heat, that we will introduce a motion of non-confidence in the Prime Minister. It will read that the House declare non-confidence in the Prime Minister and his costly government for increasing the carbon tax by 23% on April 1st as part of his plan to quadruple the tax while Canadians cannot afford to eat, heat, and house themselves and call for the House to be dissolved so Canadians can vote in a carbon tax election. election. And in that carbon tax election, there will be a very simple choice. On the one hand, you will have the carbon tax coalition of the NDP and Justin Trudeau, who take your money, punish your work, tax your food, double your housing costs, and unleash crime and chaos in your community, or common sense conservatives who will ax the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. We have a common sense plan that will bring home lower prices by axing the carbon tax uh, and by capping spending and cutting waste to bring down the deficit, inflation, and interest rates. We will eliminate the waste in government, like the $60 million Arrive Can app, like the billion dollar green fund that only funds liberal insiders, like the $21 billion or $1,400 per family Trudeau is spending on consultants, outside consultants, high-priced consultants that cost you more. We will eliminate this waste and we will bring home fiscal sanity to fix the budget. We will also build the homes. After eight years of Trudeau housing, costs have doubled because we have the fewest homes per capita in the G7. Common sense conservatives will require cities permit 15% more home building as a condition of getting federal funds. Those that beat the target will get a bonus. Those that miss the target will pay a fine. That will mean that municipal bureaucracies get paid like realtors and builders. They get paid for the number of homes they build and sell. We want municipalities to get paid for the number of homes they permit. 
We're going to sell off 6,000 buildings and thousands of acres of federal land to build, build, build. We'll take the carbon tax off, which will reduce the cost of materials and transportation of those materials to build those homes. We will stop the crime. We will bring jail and not bail for repeat violent offenders. We will bring treatment and not more legalized and subsidized yeah. hard drugs to bring our loved ones home drug free. We will secure the border and lock up gun criminals and smugglers instead of targeting licensed, law-abiding, trained and tested sports shooters and hunters. Yeah. We will do all of this to bring home and to bring hope to the Canadian people. The Canadian people who suffered so, so badly over the last eight years, who remember the country that they loved and the country in which they still believe. A country where hard work will once again pay off. Where a trucker who d delivers us the goods for 50 years will be able to live a good and dignified retirement. A country where young couples will be able to plan a new home in which they can have beautiful babies and, and raise a wonderful future for themselves and their families. A, a, a future where our kids can walk safely on the streets, where families do not need to peer out their window to see if their car has been stolen or worse yet, leave their keys at the front door so that the thieves can simply take them as they please. A country that is proud of itself, proud of its history, proud of its heritage and optimistic about its future. A country where the state is servant and not master with small government and big citizens. A country that puts the common common people first, the common sense of the common people united for our common home, your home, my home, our home. Let's bring it home. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So there was Pierre Polliver. He was, uh, Basically, he, he's, he's given the vote of confidence, though. Thanks for watching, and we're going live to Parliament as I'm speeching. They're just opening the sitting. Um, o Canada. I can't put O Canada on. Um, I've been flagged by a Colombian company. So O Canada is out of bounds until, um, until we do the live showing and all that. Um, so we're just waiting for them to take their seats and sing their song. And uh, they're there now. Where are you? Yeah, okay, they're coming in. It's a question period. Where is Trudeau? Let's look this up here. Trudeau, will he be in the house? Okay, so... Oh, yeah, there's some news here today, too. Um, uh, first of all, let's, oh, oh, no, no, no itinerary for today. So, oh, here we go. We got it. I got it. Uh, the Prime Minister will, uh, 8.30 a.m. in the morning, um, he participated in a Summit for Democracy 2024. He will deliver remarks at the leader-level plenary session uh, entitled Technology, Elections, Misinformation, and disinformation. Oh, that's probably why the chat has been uh, extra unruly today with um, a couple names I don't recognize. Probably some liberal members throwing some monkey wrenches in my chat. That's probably what happened. I'm going to go through it all and, and wipe out all the other things at the end of it. Sorry um, if you get caught in the mix, but uh, that's what's happening. Um, then 10.30, he uh, attended a national caucus meeting. And he will attend question period, and it's it's on right now. I don't, I, like they are on, but not on yet. Sure is laugh out loud. So he's doing that. So there's some other news. This is the big news that I, I saw it in the chat. Also, people have been talking about it. Premier, this is CBC. Uh, title is fury warns of mass arrest as fish harvesters vow to continue your protest who look they're starting to ride so the protests can pin continue in newfoundland um so protests protests continue to call for out-of-province sales for all species this is uh 
uh, Ryan Cook and Ariana Kaland. Here's just the gist of it, the whole thing. But Premier Andrew Fury, uh, a liberal, hopes the provincial budget will unve- will be unveiled on Thursday. Quote, if it is safe to do so, end of quote, after protests shut down Confederation Building on Wednesday at 1.31 p.m. NT News Conference, Fury and members of his cabinet addressed questions on the government's decision to seek injunction against the protesters in the Supreme Court of Newfoundland of Labrador. And Labrador. The injunction was granted by uh, by a judge on Wednesday morning, ordering protesters to provide a safe access to the building. They still haven't. They're still not there yet. No one wants 500 people to be arrested tomorrow evening, uh, morning, um, prior to the injunction being granted. So th- they're they're all they've been you know very angry. Still not in the house. And so that's two minutes late. Um, yeah, maybe it is two fifteen um, today, but it, it schedule was for two. Um, they have to do uh, a few things. They have to sing their national anthem, a couple other orders of business before they get through it. Um, and, and that's what's going on. We're almost there, like we're seconds away, seconds here. So what happened on Thursday? So, okay, so Harvester Jason Sullivan told the CBC he wasn't sure if the injunction will stop them from showing up. Um, so it, someone can say in the chat if they're there. But they're, they're angry. Uh, provincial government spokesperson Victoria Barber announced the budget's postponement until further notice due to an unsafe environment in which fish harvesters are preventing public service employees from entering the Confederation building complex. They're very upset. There's all kinds of photos of very angry MPs and things. You can check this out on CBC. Okay, here we go. They're up. Oh, they're singing. All right. I, I, I'm sorry. I can't put the sound on. I, I wish uh, that was not the case. Um, but there we have it. We can sing together. Oh, Canada. Here, maybe I, I, I'll put up my own here. Okay. But um, there's something something on it online. People have taken Oh Canada and it's been copyrighted somehow. So it's basically, um, well, it, it's copyrighted. Someone's got it. So I can, but they're all singing happily. Oh, sorry about the black corner. Okay, they're done singing. Let's listen to them. <laughs> If I could have your attention, please. Statements by members. Déclaration de député, d'honorable député de Saanich Gulf Islands. Open. Also, it's now clear for Canadians what we all knew. Records have been smashed, records have been broken, and that this winter was... Just the warmest the winter on record in Canada. And according to senior climatologists, the warmest year on record by a stunning margin. And it's not just the land that's hotter and drier, it's the oceans. I refer members to a recent article in The New Yorker by Elizabeth Colbert. Why is the sea so hot? Temperatures in our oceans reached a shift below 70 degrees Fahrenheit globally and since the start of 2024 they're going up. Are we The Honourable Member from Scarborough North 
Mr. Speaker, today I rise to recognize the 50th anniversary of Burner Trail Junior Public School in Scarborough North. Since opening its doors in 1973, the esteemed institution has shaped the lives of countless students, parents, teachers, and staff. Honoring their school motto, Better Together, students, past and present, are reconnecting and reminiscing over fond memories and moments. The commitment and dedication of educators, parents, and community members have undoubtedly contributed to decades of excellence in education. Indeed, the name of the school is derived from C.H. Burner Public School, a single-room red brick schoolhouse at Finch Avenue East and Nielsen Road that dates to 1872. Today, Burner Trail's legacy continues with a vibrant and diverse student population located in the heart of the Malvern community. Congratulations to Principal Jamie Walsh and the entire school community on reaching this remarkable milestone, wishing them many more years of success. Next. The Honourable Member from Edmonton, Mustasquin. Mr. Speaker, Helen Keller once said, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. And in that spirit today, I'm going to pay tribute to two organizations making a fantastic impact across Canada. First, March is Easter Seals Month, and a great time to recognize the wonderful work that Easter Seals Canada has done for over 100 years in Canada. Easter Seals' vision is to fully enhance the quality of life, well-being, and independence of Canadians living with disabilities, and they are consistently a leading and reliable partner in efforts to do just that. Also in this Marvel-like universe of inclusion champions is Special Olympics Canada, who hosted their 2024 Winter Games in Calgary at the end of February. It was incredible to see thousands of athletes, volunteers and families descend on our province of Alberta for the week of intense competition, joyful celebration and powerful community engagement. To all of the superheroes at Easter Seals and Special Olympics, thank you for the life-changing work that you do every single day. You are truly unstoppable. The Honourable Member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Mr. Speaker, I invite everyone to join us in Kitchener, Conestoga on Saturday, April 6th, as we celebrate the 60th annual Elmira Maple Syrup Festival. Since its start in 1965, the festival has grown to become the largest single day maple syrup festival in the world. The community of Elmira, with a population of 12,000, will welcome up to 80,000 guests. Individuals and families can take part in the pancake flipping contest, family fun arena, live music, toy and craft show, and of course enjoy pancakes drenched in maple syrup. Thank you to the Elmira Maple Syrup Festival Committee for your dedication, thanks to the sponsors for your financial support, and thanks to the volunteers who work tirelessly to make this festival happen. All proceeds are returned to our community's charitable and not-for-profit organizations. So from the morning breakfast to entering a team in the pancake flipping contest, to savoring the food, supporting the vendors, and enjoying artists, I know that my family and everyone will have a great day at the Elmira Maple Seal Festival. See you there. The Honorable Member for Trois-Rivières. Mr. Speaker, Jean Ferrat sang how life is so beautiful, and today I would say the francophonie is so beautiful. Around the world, the francophonie is a living force which gives culture its wings and creates dialogue between them. It's poetry, literature, values, living together from Morocco to Louisiana, from Quebec to Belgium, from Cote d'Ivoire to Tahiti, from Vietnam to Mauritius. It's everywhere. David Chalamet in Louisiana and Patrice Desbiens in Sudbury each have their own way of writing poetry in French. Aimé Césaire, poet, dramatist, and essayist, has also expressed the francophonie. And Dany Laferriere, our very own immortal, who makes us all feel so proud. And the francophonie also promises us a better world based on youth, joy, and friendship. And thanks to its unique timbre, French creates a sense of celebration in our hearts, in our souls, in our very beings. So I would like to wish all of you happy and immortal day of the Francophonie. Our deputy d'Orléans. Mr. Speaker, today is March 20th, International Day of the Francophonie. I'd like to thank all of the Francophone organizations and institutions throughout our country and in my community of Orléans for the hard work they've put into helping our language thrive. I'd also like to recognize two Francophone leaders in Orléans, Nicole and Louis Patry, 
who received the Champlain Prize for the Francophonie 2024 at the Francophonie Gala. And on March 1st, I celebrated International Women's Day with 120 exceptional women from Orléans who all came to my annual lunch. I also had the honor of recognizing 38 women and girls by giving them the Orléans Leadership Award for Women and Girls for 2024. Thanks, thank you to everyone. Congratulations and happy Francophonie Day. From Fort McMurray, Cold Lake. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate the Holy Trinity Catholic High School 3A boys basketball team who took home gold last week at the 2024 Alberta School Athletic Association Provincial Championships. Here, here. This is a historic accomplishment for the Knights Nation as they become the first team north of Edmonton to ever bring home a provincial basketball title. The Knights rallied together, overcoming all odds to secure their victory in a game-winning three free throw in overtime on home turf. Wow. I want to thank Principal Luan Demers, Vice Principal Athletics, Kevin Garbuya, the coaching team, parents, volunteers, and of course, the amazing athletes who brought this all together. Your hard work and teamwork have paid off, and you've made your school and your entire community so proud. Go Knights, go! Yeah. Yeah. The Honorable Member from Kitchener South, Hesper. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, this coming Sunday, March 24th, is World Tuberculosis Day. TB is the leading infectious disease killer in the world, only briefly passed by COVID-19 at the height of the pandemic. As an airborne disease, TB can spread rapidly, and it can be deadly unless properly treated. In 2022 alone, 1.3 million people lost their lives to TB, and millions more were infected. In January 2023, I had the opportunity to travel with Results Canada to Kenya. I saw firsthand how Canadian international assistance is efficiently and effectively used to fight TB. Dedicated community health workers and local organizations are tireless in ensuring people receive the safe and dignified treatment they need to recover from TB. Yesterday morning, I had the honor to co-host a parliamentary breakfast where parliamentarians from all parties came together to hear from leading expert and passionate advocates who stand united in their vision of a world without TB. There's more to be done, but with effort and political will. L'honorable député de Nickel Belt. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to celebrate Dietitians Day in Canada. Household food security is top of mind for many Canadians. Dietitians work hard to empower the health of individuals and communities. They are regulated health professionals who support children and adults with many illnesses such as diabetes and developing a healthy eating plan that regulates blood sugar. Dietitians work directly with other healthcare professionals, undertake scientific research, drive innovation, and inform public policy. Malnutrition has profound repercussions on people's physical and mental health. Dietitians within our health network can have a real positive impact. They ensure that people have the resources they need to make healthier food choices, both for urban Canadians, rural Canadians, people with specific needs, and Indigenous people. Let's recognize the importance of this profession in creating a healthier nation. Thank you very much to all our dietitians. The Honourable Member from Brantford Brent. Mr. Speaker, this government's track record in following basic rules is not just disappointing, it's downright disgusting. Right. And now, after a 16-month study at Government Operations Committee, today the government announces new measures to identify fraudulent billing cases. Five million dollars so far has been identified involving three subcontractors billing 36 different federal departments. This dates back to 2018, Mr. Speaker. New ways of fraudulent billing will soon be uncovered. The RCMP have received referrals. What took this government so long, and when will Canadian taxpayers get their money back? Yeah. 
Then I have Deputy the Honourable Member from Mount Royal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today marks the 38th anniversary of the Mad Science Group. Founded in 1987 by youthful visionaries Ron Schlein and his brother Ariel, the Mad Science Group has evolved into a national gem that has ignited the spirits of countless young minds across Canada and beyond. Mad Science has fundamentally altered how children engage with STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Through awe-inspiring experiments and immersive encounters, it has kindled flames of curiosity and nurtured an unwavering love of learning. Mad Science not only impacts young learners, but also serves as a platform for career-oriented employment, having empowered over 70,000 passionate individuals to share their fervor for knowledge. As we commemorate 38 glorious years, let us extend gratitude to the contributing visionaries, educators, and supporters. Their tireless efforts have transformed countless lives. I am proud to honor Mad Science, especially my friends Ron and Ariel Schlein. May you continue to demystify science for future generations and illuminate their path of discovery. Here, here. Thank you. Good job. The Honourable Member from Northumberland, Peterborough. I just want to note, um, MP Housefather, the one who was just speaking, is um, he's sitting on the fence. He's very upset about this last uh, motion, um, which he says is very much against Israel. Uh, Housefather, he's Israeli, and has a, and, and more, even more to the point, he's in a very um, Jewish section of the planet a high Jewish population. So, you know, they're his rep he's representing them. So he's very upset. There's there's talk that he may leave the party. Uh, he may leave cabinet. First of all, he may leave cabinet. Then he may leave the party and go as an independent. There's possibility of that. He didn't go to the cabinet Morton retreat this morning. And then there's also talk. Could he actually flip sides and go to the conservatives? Ooh, House Father, he, he, he's a, an amusing MP. He's he, he's a smart. He's lawyer. Um and he's effective. So him leaving um, the uh, liberals would be a, a, a not, you know, it would be a big, big shock. Anyway, so let's back to the show. So, Mr. Speaker, the government cannot give anyone anything that they did not first take from someone else. Right. Right. In the case of the carbon tax and the so-called rebate, the government's literally taking from one pocket and putting it to the other, but not before stuffing their own. No. Canadians are smart enough to recognize a scam when they see it. This carbon tax shell game, well, it's gone on for long enough. The facts are in, the verdict is here. The PBO has said that Ontario families are paying $1,647 while only getting a rebate of about $1,000. Wow. That means every Canadian Ontario family is short $600. Mm -hmm. In Coburg, volunteers at a local warming center have told me that for the first time ever, they have clients who have full-time jobs, who can't afford to do anything else because they can't afford food and they can't access shelter. If we need a Canada that works for those who do the work. Yeah. Seven premiers, 70% of Canadians agree. It's They're opposed to carbon, a carbon tax. It's time to vote non-confidence. It's time to spite the, the hike. And it's time to axe the tax. The Honourable Member from Tilawak Hope. British Columbians pay the highest gas prices in Canada thanks to punishingly high taxes, with the cost of gas going to over $2 a litre this week. On April 1st, these Liberals and their BC NDP toadies will push prices even higher, with a 23% hike on the carbon tax, driving the cost of gas, groceries and home heating to record highs. Many British Columbians are struggling to put food on their table and keep a roof over their heads, and now the Liberals, with the help of the BC the NDP are going to make life even more expensive. Nearly 200,000 people in BC use food banks in a single month. They cannot afford another tax increase. But BC NDP Premier David Eby is only too happy to do the Prime Minister's bidding and impose this made in Ottawa Liberal NDP carbon tax hike on British Columbians. Only common sense Conservatives are speaking up for the people of BC who are saying enough is enough. Their message, like ours, is to spike the hike or call a carbon tax election. Yeah. The Honourable Member for London West. Today is International Day of the Francophonie, and I would like to speak about the vibrant Franco-Ontarian community in London and throughout the world. Let me just mention some numbers. French is an official language in 29 countries. 
There are 450 million Francophones throughout the world. I am a proud Franco-Ontarian, and I would like to mention the fact that Franco-Ontarians have made important contributions to our country. They've contributed a great deal to the Francophone, to Francophone culture in Canada outside Quebec. Thanks to Francophones in London, we have two school, Francophone school boards in 10 schools. We have resources to help new arrivals to thrive in French. I would like to thank all of the organizations that are working hard to support our community. I would like to thank and congratulate all Francophones in London, Ontario, and Canada. Member from Victoria. Mr. Speaker, Donna, Sheila, and Julie are three women who have given me permission to share their stories. They are among the 27 screening officers at the Victoria Airport who recently lost their jobs. CAPSA, the Canadian Air Transport Security Authority, disqualified these workers, forcing their employer to fire them, despite the employer wanting to keep them on. Donna is a single mom with two kids. She's extremely worried about how she's going to make rent next month. Sheila had, has had to search for a new home for her family in a housing crisis. Julie lives with a disability. She's been a loyal employee with CATSA for 16 years. She was given no right to appeal. The infractions cited were as small as not looking under a bottle lid. They were never given any warnings. They weren't offered more training. These workers deserve better. CATSA's decision to disqualify as unionized workers without due process undermines collective bargaining. All these screening officers are keen to return to work. I'm urging the Labour Minister to investigate this matter and find answers the employees deserve. The Honourable Member for Beauport, Côte de Beaupré, Ile d'Orléans, Charlevoix. We have some wonderful visitors here on the Hill today, Mr. Speaker. More than a dozen mayors have all come to see us on the Hill, and just having them here from such a beautiful riding reminds me of the river, the hills, the islands, and everything that makes the riding so incredible. And maybe this is an opportunity to partially repair the unfortunate remarks that have been made recently and instead congratulate our municipal elected officials on their very hard work. After all, it's no easy task. They have to show rigor, leadership, in-depth knowledge on the ground, and of laws and regulations. They must also show empathy, kindness, and courage. For me and my colleagues in the block, it is very important to underscore their commitment and express our gratitude, admiration, and our support because they stand at the very heart of our towns and villages. Hats off to our elected officials at the municipal level, and I hope that they all enjoy their stay among us. The Honourable Member from Calgary, Forest Lawn. After eight years, this Liberal NDP Prime Minister and his carbon tax scam are not worth the cost as Canadians get poorer. Two million Canadians visit a food bank in a single month with a million more projected to this year. Yet these climate zealots will hike the carbon tax 23% on April the 1st, making the cost of everything more expensive. The PBO proved that Canadians pay more into this scam than what they get back in these phony rebates. 70% of premiers and Canadians reject this carbon tax scam, including Liberal premiers. That's why our common sense Conservative leader is calling a no confidence vote on this Liberal NDP Prime Minister to spike the hike. Will the Liberal lapdog NDP and inflationist bloc stand with a majority of Canadians and common sense Conservatives to call on this Prime Minister to spike the hike, or will they continue to support the scam? It's time for a carbon tax election so Canadians can scrap this Prime Minister and Conservatives can axe the tax. The Honourable Member for Laval Les Îles. Mr. Speaker, the Rever Reverend Father Hadi Mafouz is a, an eminent personage for all Lebanese people, especially for Maronite Christians. He became the leader of the Maronite Order in 2022. He speaks a number of languages Arabic, French, English, Italian, Spanish, and German. He has published many books and articles on Bible exegesis. He has created a relationship between the Holy Spirit University of Kazlik and the University of Montreal, especially, especially HEC Montreal. And there are a number of programs and diplomas that exist in collaboration between the two. 
In 2016, he became the director of the monastic order. And ever since, he has shown his exemplary leadership and transparent personality. He is serving all Lebanese people of all, of all faiths throughout the world. Thank you. Oral questions, questions chef The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. The Common Sense Conservatives have a plan to cut taxes, build the homes, fix the budget, stop the crime. However, the prime, the costly prime minister, with the support of the Bloc Québécois, is inflating inflation with taxes and deficits. That and. The Prime Minister wants even greater tax hikes on the 1st of April. Will the Prime Minister inverse his inflationary policies, or are we going to have to defeat him with a no-confidence vote and an election on taxes? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The carbon remittance puts more money in the pockets of eight out of ten families under federal jurisdiction. We give more families to families whilst fighting against climate change, Mr. Speaker. That's what the vast majority of Canadians want. Unfortunately, however, the Conservatives, uh, Conservative politicians, don't want to help affordability. They don't want to help fighting climate change. Luckily, the majority in this House wants to fight against climate change and give more money to Canadians. And that is what we are trying to do. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. That's quite the opposite compared to what the parliamentary budget officer said on the 18th of March, of March, he said, when we consider the economic impacts of the carbon tax, most families will pay more and be negatively impacted by the carbon tax. So what the Prime Minister said is simply not true. Canadians will pay more than what they receive. And there's a second carbon tax that is directly applicable on the on the backs of Quebecers. So will the Bloc Québécois vote for Quebec families, or will they vote again for their real boss, the Prime Minister of the Federal Government of Canada? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, if the Leader of the Opposition stopped talking and started listening to Canadians, he would understand that Canadians know that the cost of inaction with regards to climate change are huge. Forest fires, floodings, droughts that cost a lot to our farmers and producers, our fishers. This is a reality, and we are fighting against this on this side of the House, whilst putting more money in the pockets of eight out of ten families throughout the country. The carbon remittance delivers for Canadian families, and the Conservative Party wants to take it away from Canadian families. Then I have chef de l'opposition. While common sense Conservatives will axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost, with the Parliamentary Budget Officer testifying again that the majority of households will see a negative impact as a result of the carbon tax. End quote. Now he wants to hike the, the tax on April Fool's Day. We won't stand for it. So what will it be with this Prime Minister? Will he spike the hike or will he face a non-confidence vote at a carbon tax election? Yeah. Le Sorry, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, the Parliamentary Budget Officer's report lays out clearly that 8 out of 10 Canadian families across the country where the price on pollution applies get more money back every year. That's how we put more money in the pockets of Canadians while having one of the strongest plans to fight climate change across, around the world. That's what the Conservative Party is standing against right now. Money in the pockets of Canadian families and a real plan to fight climate change that is working, Mr. Speaker, that is bringing down emissions, that is making us more competitive, that is helping build the future. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, I'm going to read again the testimony from the March 18th appearance of the Parliamentary Budget Officer. Once you factor in the rebate, but also the economic impacts, the majority, the majority of households will see a negative impact as a result of the carbon tax. End quote. The Prime Minister plans to make this problem worse with a carbon tax hike on heat, on homes, on fuel, on food. We will not stand for it. So once again, which will it be? Will he spike the hike or will we have a carbon tax election? Yeah. The right on
Honourable Prime Minister. What will it be, Mr. Speaker? It will be that Canadians get more money That's with right. the Canada carbon rebate. Eighty percent of Canadian households uh, in areas where the federal carbon tax applies get more money than every year from the Canada carbon rebate than they pay in the price on pollution. Right. On top of that, we are fighting climate change, making our industries more competitive, and preparing a better future. There is no plan on the Conservative side of the house to either help Canadians with rebate checks or fight climate change. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, not only did the Parliamentary Budget Officer testify that the majority of households will pay more in carbon taxes than they will get back in rebates, he, there is a table showing that every single province in which this tax applies, the middle class families pay vastly more than they get back, and Canadians know it, because under this Prime Minister, they've seen their food, their fuel, their homes, their heating go through the roof. But why why don't we just end the debate and let Canadians decide and have a carbon tax election? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Parliamentary Budget Officer clearly spelled out that 8 out of 10 Canadian families in areas where the price on pollution applies get more money That's because we created a plan that not only is one of the strongest plans to fight climate change in the world, but it puts more money back in the pockets of middle class Canadians as we build a stronger future, better careers, more competitiveness, and a safer environment for generations to come. That's the plan we have. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Yesterday, the Prime Minister told a great joke. He said how well he collaborates with the Premier of Quebec. However, the facts show that everyone in the National Assembly of Quebec, except the Liberals, are asking that Quebec have full powers with regards to immigration. The Prime Minister of Canada has refused an essential request from Quebec. Is that how he sees Canada's friendship with Quebec? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, my Honourable colleague knows full well that Quebec has more powers in immigration than any other province. And he knows full well that I spoke last Friday with Premier Legault to say, yes, let us work together to reach our objectives, our common objectives. We are here to help companies. We are here to make sure that services are available. We are here to help with housing. We will work hand in hand with Quebec, as we have always done. We are here to deliver for Quebecers and all Canadians all together. The Honourable Member for belle chambly if the Prime Minister is here to deliver for Quebecers, well, it's just another failure on his part. The government of Quebec has paid for education, for health care, for income supplements, and uh, child care. The Liberal government said, yes, pay up front and we'll reimburse you later. The bill is up to $1 billion, and now... Quebec has a huge deficit because of this, and now the federal government is saying, deal with it, because I'm not going to give you my $1 billion. You're my friend, but go right on, go right on home. The right honourable prime minister. I would be very careful if I was the leader of the bloc, because he seems to think that there are more Quebecers on his side of the house than ours. We speak on behalf of Quebecers, we represent Quebecers, and we're here to work hand in hand to deliver results for Quebecers. With regards to health, we are working very hard to make sure that there are improvements in healthcare services. The federal government is here to disperse billions upon billions of dollars for Quebec priorities. We are here to work together and will continue to do so throughout this house as Quebecers.
The Honourable Member from Edmonton, Greasebaugh. First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities across Canada are slipping further behind. Kids can't access health services and homes are falling apart. But what are the Liberals doing? Threatening to cut billions in services communities rely on. And if we're up to the Conservative leader, Indigenous services would be gutted all together. The Liberals and Conservatives seem to always find ways to make rich CEOs even richer, but never find money for real people. Will the Prime Minister honour his commitments to Indigenous people or leave them out to dry? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are unequivocally committed and have been since 2015 to working in partnership with First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities across the country to advance self-determination and reconciliation. We have tripled investments in Indigenous housing, mental health, access to clean drinking water and jobs to contribute to economic reconciliation. We also move forward to compensate First Nations children and families who suffered under the discriminatory child welfare system. We've built over 30,000 homes since 2016, and we recently announced that we will move forward in creating an Indigenous loan support program. There is, of course, much more to do, but we will keep doing it. The Honourable Member from Edmonton, Greensboro. Mr. Speaker, that answer is little comfort to the residential school survivors and children who rely on those services. Imagine having to live in a moldy home with your young children knowing that it isn't a healthy place for them. That's the heartbreaking situation First Nations are facing across the country. The Auditor General says herself that this government has no plan to close the housing gaps that they're keeping First Nations in inhumane conditions. Shame. Shame. When will the Prime Minister take First Nations housing seriously and provide the communities with the resources they desperately need. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. We have made historic investments in housing in Indigenous communities after decades of wrongful underfunding by previous governments of all stripes. And we are working every single day to do more. We're committed to working in partnership with First Nations and their communities. We thank the Auditor General for her work and her report, and we'll continue to move forward to do even more in partnership with Indigenous people across this country. That I have chef. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Social parties, there's been an outbreak of common sense mm -hmm. yeah. on the carbon tax. In fact, Nova Scotia Liberals, NDPers, and Conservatives passed a unanimous motion in their legislature this week calling on their federal MPs to vote against the Prime Minister's 23% carbon tax hike. No wonder. The cost of the carbon tax to the average Nova Scotia family will be $1,605, according to the Parliamentary Budget Officer. $1,605. How much will be the rebate for the average family? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the federal price on pollution is a backstop. It's a system that we put in place to both fight climate change everywhere across the country and put more money back in the pockets of Canadian families where it applies. Every single province had and continues to have the option to replace the federal price on pollution with their own program as long as it is as rigorous and stringent as the federal uh, price on pollution. As long as they have a plan to fight climate change, they can do what they want as long as it's strong enough. That's the options the provinces have. So they can take that option. We're going to keep money. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. That's demonstrably false because Nova Scotia actually has a climate change plan, which he rejected and overrode with a federal carbon tax that is opposed by New Democrats, Liberals, and Conservatives unanimously in the province's legislature. But you notice he wouldn't answer my question. He's been bragging about these rebates. But then when we talk about the cost, all of a sudden he forgets the rebates. So I'm going to give him a second chance. In the province of Nova Scotia, the cost to the average family will be $1,500. $1,500. $1,500 per Nova Scotia family. How much is the rebate? Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, that is simply not true. The reality is for 8 out of 10 families right across the country in backstop provinces, families do better off with the Canada carbon rebate than they do with uh, the extra costs of the price on pollution. This is a plan to fight climate change, but it's also a plan to put more money 
in the pockets of families from coast to coast to coast. Now, the Conservative leader doesn't care about fighting against climate change, and he doesn't care about affordability either, because he would rip up the rebate checks, uh, and he would do less on fighting climate change. We're going to keep delivering for Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Still won't answer the question. All the Liberal ministers came in with little cue cards a week ago with all these rebates on them. They were waving them around, very proud. Yep. And then when we went to the Parliamentary Budget Officer and said, give us the full price by province, and we quoted that, for example, in Nova Scotia, it's $1,500 in cost to the average family, according to the PBO. Again, $1,500 in costs. What is the rebate? The number. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, we see the lengths to which uh, the Conservative Party will go to mislead Canadians about a plan that fights climate change and puts more money in the pockets out of eight or ten Canadian families. The parliamentary budget officer himself admitted and said that you cannot take his words out of context because he did not calculate the costs of inaction on fighting climate change. He did not calculate the competitive advantages of the innovation and the solutions and the economic growth that comes with putting a price on pollution. The Conservative Party are not telling the full story. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, he did not, the Parliamentary Budget Officer did not include the cost of climate change because the carbon tax doesn't address the cost of climate change. The Parliamentary Budget Officer made clear the carbon tax will do nothing to change the cost of climate change, and that's why it costs, the tax costs more for every family in every province. So let's go to Alberta, where the uh, per, two of the NDP leadership camp candidates have come out against the carbon tax, and the Prime Minister's only friend in the province, Nahid Nenshi, has gone on totally silent. Albertans will pay $2,900 in carbon tax per family. What will be the rebate for them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, $1,800 a year is the average, uh, is the family of four in Alberta uh, carbon re Canada carbon rebate. That is helping them and according to an analysis by the Parliamentary Budget Officer is more than they pay in extra price on pollution because of the price we put into the federal level. The price on pollution puts more money in the pockets out of 8 of 10 Canadian families and fights climate change while building a stronger, more competitive future. The Conservatives have no plan to fight climate change and no plan to help Canadians with rebate checks. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. All right, he found his cue card, yeah. and he finally talked about the rebate. So he says the average family in Alberta will get $1,800 while they pay $2,943. Oh. In other words, next year alone, after this forthcoming hike, the average Alberta family will pay $1,100 more in carbon taxes than he gives back in his phony checks. Will the Prime Minister tell us if he understands that $2,900 is bigger than $1,800? <laughs> the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, how about a different stat? A stat that the analyzed, turns out that for an average income quintile group, the average household of 2.5 Canadians, average net benefit per household in Alberta, $723 a year. Wow. That's $723 in the pockets of the average Albertan family because we put a price on pollution that puts more money back in the pockets out of 8 out of 10 Canadian families. That is what we are doing. That's how we fight climate change. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. He wants you to know, Mr. Speaker, he has alternative facts. <laughs> I get mine from the Parliamentary Officer. That reports directly to Parliament and is independent. He's reporting, he's using numbers that come from officials that report to him and depend on him for their job. So let's take another province, Ontario, where the Liberal Leader has now come out against this Prime Minister's carbon tax. Maybe she knows that the average cost to an Ontario family of the federal carbon tax is $1,674. Well, 
dollars for this coming year. How much is the rebate in Ontario? <laughs> Honourable Prime Minister. The average net benefit per household in Ontario is $255 a year. Wow. That is fighting, cli fighting climate change while putting more money in the pockets of Canadians. The parliamentary budget officer himself demonstrated that 8 out of 10 Canadian families in regions that get the carbon price backstop do better with the price on pollution, put more money back in their pockets than it costs them on the fight for climate change. This is the plan we're delivering for Canadians. That's the plan he wants to scrap. The Honourable Member for Belleau Chambly. Mr. Speaker, I don't really believe in polls, so let's not stop, our, stop talking about polls. But at the end of the day, the Prime Minister should realise that he's he needs to realise who speaks for who. In all polls, for the longest time, the bloc has always been ahead the liberal, of the Liberals. If the Prime Minister is so low in the polls, so low that even the Conservatives are in front of them in Canada, it's perhaps because they don't respect Quebec, Quebecers, or the National Assembly of Quebec. Does he believe that this strategy is good because he knows that he is never going to gain any more in uh, Quebec, or does he just do it because harming Quebec is a good look for the rest of Canada? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Canadians know full well that in democracy there is one poll that counts, and that's the actual election day. Over the past three elections, the Liberal Party has garnered more seats in Quebec than the Bloc Québécois because we are here to actually deliver tangible results for Quebecers and all Canadians with health agreements, with dental health, for health for seniors, with $6 billion for child care in Quebec, with investments that help to create economic growth jobs for the future for Quebecers, and a greener world for all. These are the investments we do to represent Quebec and will continue to deliver, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bello chambly I think that there's a bit of vulnerability coming through. The Liberals don't know if they'll be sat on their side or the other side after the next elections. If they really want to listen to Quebecers, if they really want to pretend they're listening to Quebecers, they will give more immigration powers to uh, Quebec. They will invest more in Quebec health care. At the moment, they're doing nothing, and all they do is read the pre-prepared cards. Will the Prime Minister finally at least pretend to do his job for Quebecers? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Let's talk about tangible facts, Mr. Speaker. 1.5 million Canadians and seniors have now registered to our dental plan. Dental plans against which the Conservatives voted, by the way. Over a third of these seniors are from Quebec. That's hundreds of thousands of senior Quebecers who will finally get dental care for free, thanks to the federal government's investments in health care. We are here to deliver for Quebecers. We'll always be here for Quebecers and all Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Now the legislature in Newfoundland and Labrador has acknowledged that this Prime Minister is not worth the cost after eight years. They passed a motion supported by the Liberal Premier and personal friend of the Prime Minister to oppose the April 1st tax hike. They must have heard from the Parliamentary op Budget Officer that the cost to Newfoundlanders of the carbon tax this year will be $1,874. $1,874. $1,874 for the average Newfoundland and Labrador family. What will their re rebate be? Prime Minister. Speaker, the average net benefit per household in Newfoundland and Labrador is $303 a year. That's the money that they pocket uh, with our price on pollution and the Canada carbon rebate checks uh, that go into households across the province. The province is open to creating its own price on pollution, its own plan to fight climate change. As long as it's as strong as the federal backstop, they're welcome to do that if they want to do it a different way. But for the meantime, we're going to both fight climate change and deliver more money to the families in Newfoundland and Labrador. 
The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. So here are the facts from the Parliamentary Budget Officer. They're directly from him. The, the cost to the average Newfoundland family is $1,874. The rebate is $1,497 for a net cost of $377. A net cost, a net loss of $377 and growing. These are the facts. The Prime Minister, the Prime Minister stop denying the facts and if he really wants to contest and argue that he should be able to raise the tax, why doesn't he have the courage to call an election and let Canadians decide? Yeah. The right honourable Prime Minister. We are busy delivering for Canadians a, a, a price on pollution that puts more money in the pockets out of eight out of ten families across the country. And an election on the price on pollution? We had three, Mr. Speaker, and we won them all. joining a Facebook group learning how they can eat a meal out of a dumpster and now his best solution is to hike the tax on their heats, on their homes, on their fuel, on their food. If he really believes in it, why doesn't he call a carbon tax election now? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Hey, Speaker, we've heard time and time again over these past many months, uh, the Leader of the Opposition talk about how Canada is broken. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are focused on supporting Canadians with things like child care and dental care and a plan to fight climate change that puts more money in the pockets out of eight of ten Canadian families right across the country. That is the approach that is delivering for Canadians, and we've still got more work to do, and we're going to continue keep doing it to deliver for Canadians every single day we're in this House. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, yesterday the Finance Minister claimed that the carbon tax was revenue neutral, that it gave back, <laughs> that, that the government didn't keep a single penny. Well, it turns out they keep hundreds of billions of pennies. They're collect they've collected so far $20.7 billion and only paid back $18.6 billion. In other words, they profited by over $2 billion by pillaging the pockets of Canadians. When will the Canadian people get their $2 billion back? And if he's so sure, sure, sure about taking it away, why doesn't he call an election to defend it? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. The, the Conservative leader is now complaining about $2 billion that he would never give to Canadian businesses, would never give to Canadians because he would scrap the Canada carbon rebate. We are actually delivering money across the country to communities, to individuals, to small businesses, to Indigenous communities to fight climate change and help afford their groceries. He wants to eliminate the carbon rebate. He wants to eliminate the plan to fight climate change. He has no plan for the future of the economy. Exactly. Mr. Speaker, Canada is first. Number one, the Liberals should be proud. Wait, but we're first in what? Air pollution, Mr. Speaker. For the first time, Canada is the most polluted country in North America. We're worse than the United States. When, with the climate crisis and forest fires, people are suffocating and choking. It makes them sick. People are dying, and it's only going to get worse. Is the Minister of the Environment proud to represent the most polluted country in North America? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, I understand this makes a nice clip, video clip for the NDP. We're talking about forest fires. Yes, last year, forest fires were horrendous. 
The truth is that we have to do even more to fight against climate change. But we have the Conservative Party that wants to take a step back on the fight against climate change. They want to uh, get rid of the rebates we're giving to Canadians. And the NDP never has had a plan when, uh, well, when we were we have been there with concrete action and we'll continue to be there to protect Canadians. The Honourable Member from Winnipeg Centre. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government continues to fail women, including care workers in women's shelters. And the cuts to women's shelters have not only impacted women fleeing violence, but also shelter workers who are facing a burnout crisis, consistently overworked and underpaid. 75% of the care economy are women. This is a gender equality issue. Why does the so-called feminist liberals stop wasting millions on private consultants and invest in fair wages for shelter workers to help save lives? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have demonstrated from day one that we are there to work with the provinces to invest in the care economy, whether it's commitments uh, to raise personal support worker wages to $25 an hour, whether it's our historic child care agreements uh, that are creating wa wage grids for early childhood educators, uh, whether it's moving forward on strengthening support for Indigenous communities and uh, care workers in Indigenous communities and from Indigenous communities, we will continue to be there. We recognize there is more work to do. But but we are there to do it hand in hand with the different jurisdictions across the country. The Honourable Member from Vaughan Woodbridge. Monsieur le Mr. Speaker, parents in my riding of Vaughan Woodbridge have been talking for years about how, what a hard time they're having finding daycare spaces for children. And that's why we put forward our early learning and child care bill, which the Conservative Party tried to delay. Can the Prime Minister update the House on the status of this important bill? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, child care services are not only supports for parents but also for our economy. I'm so happy to see that with our support and the support of the member for Vaughan Woodridge in our caucus, the Early Learning and Child Care Bill in Canada received royal assent yesterday. Unfortunately, the Conservative leader asked his members to obstruct and share a delay this bill. But in spite of this, we are keeping our promise to Canadians so that no matter where they live, they will have access to affordable child care that is inclusive and quality, sir, quality service. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Prime Minister is not worth the cost to our economy. Uh, real per person GDP has grown slower in Canada than all the rest of the G7. Dead last. In fact, our per capita GDP is smaller than it was five years ago. The worst record since the Great Depression. And the Parliamentary Budget Officer calculates that the carbon tax will blow an $18 billion hole in the size of our GDP, $1,000 in economic cost per family. If he really thinks that's worth the cost, why won't we have a carbon election? To yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, at the same time, our population is growing faster uh, than other countries around the world, if you're going to be telling the full story. Uh, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, our price on pollution puts more money in the pockets of eight out of ten Canadian families in the backstop provinces. This is a fact recognized by the Parliamentary Budget Officer and recognized by Canadians who see both a real plan to invest in the jobs and careers of the future, the competitiveness that Canada needs, and the fight against climate change to keep us safe while putting more money in the pockets of Canadian families from coast to coast to coast. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The government gets bigger, the people get poorer. After eight years, he's not worth the cost. He's blowing a, another $18 billion hole in our GDP with this carbon tax, a hole that will mean lower wages and a lower quality of life for the Canadian people. People. The Prime Minister now wants to quadruple the carbon tax, starting with his April Fool's Day hike. When will he realize that after eight years of Canadians lining up in food banks and living in tents, he's not worth the cost? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
Speaker, the price on pollution returns every dollar that it collects to the jurisdictions in which it's connected, uh, collected. That is the fact that built our program, our fight against climate change. The reality is we're creating jobs, we're creating growth, and we're putting more money back in the pockets out of eight out of ten Canadian families in backstop provinces. This is the plan that fights climate change, builds a stronger economy, and supports Canadians right now with rebate checks that the Leader of the Opposition would cancel. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Based on the, his own main estimates and public accounts, he's collected over $20 billion in taxes and only returned $18 billion. So it is factually inaccurate to say that he's given every penny back. Right. In fact, uh, we know that in every single province where the carbon tax applies, Canadians pay more than they get back. And there is only one provincial party that supports the tax. The B.C. NDP is happily implementing this federally ma mandated tax grab. Will the Prime Minister today allow British Columbia to cancel the April Fool's Day tax hike? Uh, here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. In a question and a contrast on facts, the reality is uh, the B.C. government has had a price on pollution since 2008, and the federal government has no involvement in British Columbia's price on pollution. Uh, it is a simple error of fact that the leader of the, Liber the Conservative Party is trying to share with this House. He must be mistaken. Maybe it's an honest mistake, uh, but the reality is uh, he is wrong on the fact on that, just like he's wrong on the fact uh, that he, he doesn't understand that 8 out of 10 Canadian families do better with the price on pollution. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Page 75 of the B.C. budget confirmed that they were bringing in the tax hike on April 1st because they're forced to by federal law. Yeah. And, according to the Vancouver Sun, their, the NDP budget and fiscal plan presented in February says the carbon tax will raise $9 billion over three years. The New Democrats plan to give back $3.5 billion in climate action tax credits to low- and middle-income folks and spend the rest as they see fit. So will the Prime Minister end the carbon tax coalition with his provincial NDP BC counterparts so that, NDP, so that can, British Columbians can get their money back? Right Honourable Prime Minister. We can think that for someone who's been railing against our plan to fight climate change and put more money in people's pockets for months now, he'd actually have done his research to understand how it works. Every single province has the ability to put forward their own plan to fight climate change as long as it is sufficiently rigorous to be fair to the other provinces that are also doing the same. That's what a Canada-wide plan to fight climate change is all about. Yes, the federal backstop gives back more money directly to Canadians uh, in 8 out of 10 cases, but BC and others are free to do their own thing. The Honourable Member for uh, Leader of the Bloc Québécois. Mr. Speaker, seated in the middle of some 100 Liberal MPs that risk losing their jobs, the Prime Minister keeps interfering into provincial jurisdiction with his drug farm care policy that we already have in Quebec, but he refuses to increase OAS. Another example, well, we're not municipal funds with their collective funds. Municipalities can do what they want. They're, the government wants to impose its own choices. Can he talk to the 12 mayors of Charlebois, tell them that he'll take a step back and let them do their job? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, the bloc leader is mistaken. We increased old, old age uh, funds for seniors that are 70 years of age or older because they know we have higher costs than others. Yes, we recognize that even in Quebec, across the country, there are people who, who cannot pay for their medications for diabetes and their contraception because they're not covered. So we'll be here to work with Quebec to deliver for Canadians so that people can have their diabetes medications and their contraceptives. We'll be here to make sure people stay healthy. The Honourable Member for Ballet Chambly, 
I don't know if seniors use a lot of contraceptives, but I know in Quebec, diabetes drugs are covered. I also, he says, I don't know what I'm talking about. The collectivity fund, well, it should be up to the municipalities to do the work that they want. But the government that says it's trying, it seems to be putting money into housing and it's asking the municipalities to put money into housing, but can the government let the municipalities do what they want with their funding? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, I think we do have challenges in terms of facts today. The Housing Accelerating Fund, Accelerator Fund across the country actually helps municipalities by helping create more housing faster, except in Quebec, where we gave the Quebec government $900 million that they added to another $900 million for municipalities across Quebec to create housing faster. We are here to work respecting jurisdiction in partnership with Quebec to help both small and large municipalities across the province. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. This Prime Minister's catch and release policies and his mismanagement of our ports. Car thefts have gone up by over 200% in Toronto, 100% in Montreal. There are 12,000 cars stolen in Canada's biggest city every single year. That is one car stolen every 40 minutes. Will the Prime Minister accept my common sense plan to scan every shipping container, reinforce our ports, and put career car thieves behind bars? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, cracking down on auto theft starts with going after organized crime. $121 million for Ontario to crack down on organized crime and car theft, and the Conservative Party voted against it. Ooh. Public Safety Minister announced $28 million for border services in collaboration with police across the country. And to stop organized crime, we're cracking down on money laundering, something the Conservative Party also voted, voted against. Right. We will take no lessons from the Conservative Party that chose to weaken our borders and pull money back from enforcement services any chance they got while they were in government. They did that. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. We pulled money back from back office bureaucracy and costly consultants that now chew up the budget. CBSA is now spending $660 million on a RIVE scam, while only five CBSA officers are, are monitoring 500,000 shipping containers at the port of Montreal. Conservatives put more CBSA agents on the front line at the port of Montreal and across the country, won't he accept my common sense plan to cut back on the consultants and put boots on the ground? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to uh, ask the Honourable Member from New Westminster Burnery please to uh, allow the questions to be asked and for answers to be given without interruption. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The Conservative government in which that leader was a minister cut hundreds if not thousands of positions in law enforcement across the country, including CBSA officers. And those back office experts who actually analyze the, uh, the bills of lading and the origins to designate and to find out where these auto thefts are happening, which containers have stolen vehicles in them. We're investing in them. We're giving more money so they can do their work. Uh, the, the common sense is nonsense that the leader of the opposition is putting forward. We know that they are all about cuts, not investments to keep a Canadian safe. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, why don't we just look at the CBSA's own numbers on this? In the first year of the Conservative government, there were a total of 12,673 CBSA officers. In the last year, there were 14,113. Okay, I know the Prime Minister's not great with numbers, but 14,000 is bigger than 12,000, right? And by the way, if he wants to analyze what whether stolen cars are in shipping containers, why doesn't he accept my plan to scan those shipping containers? Wouldn't that be common sense? Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, I'll let uh, uh, Mr. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition's high-priced high corporate lobbyist friends who give him so much money at fancy catch for access private events explain to him the impact on supply chains and shipping in Canada to try and scan 600,000 containers a day, Mr. Speaker. The fact is we are doing everything necessary to invest in countering organized crime, to track those containers and to do the work. He's not, he's, uh, he's not paying attention to the things that actually grow the country, even though he is listening to high price law. The Honourable Member from Calgary Skyview. Mr. Speaker, Calgary and my home province of Alberta is home to tens of thousands of proud Ukrainian Canadians. Since Russia's illegal war in Ukraine, Canada's commitment towards Ukraine has never been stronger, and it is why our government introduced a modernized Canada-Ukraine free trade agreement that President Zelensky asked for to be there to help Ukraine rebuild after they defeat Russia. Shamefully, the Conservative Party did not want to accept Ukraine's reasonable request for assistance. Can the Prime Minister update this House on this crucial trade agreement? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, after that Conservative leader turned his back on Ukrainians and forced his own caucus to do the same, he... Colleagues, order please. Uh, I'm going to ask the Prime Minister to start from the top. Mr. Speaker, after that Conservative leader turned his back on Ukrainians and forced his own caucus to do the same, he whipped his senators last night to vote against the Canada-Ukraine free trade agreement that Ukraine asked for. Our Liberal caucus, including the member for Calgary, Skyview, never backed down. Despite the Conservative Party's efforts to derail Ukraine's hopes to rebuilding after they win the war, the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement received royal assent last night. Leader of the opposition. The $60 million arrive scam is just the tip of the iceberg. We now learn that there are $5 million in additional fraud that has been identified by the Department of Public Procurement. And this is out of the $21 billion the Prime Minister is now spending on outside consultants, a 100% increase, and fully with the support of the NDP. Can the Prime Minister tell us how much of this $21 billion is fraud? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The situation is obviously unacceptable, which is why authorities are looking into this procurement process. Anyone who took advantage of our COVID response to save Canadian lives should face consequence. All federal contracts with these companies have been suspended as the investigation continues. But let everyone in this House notice how quickly he pivoted from a question on Ukraine. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, his members are ashamed of him for forcing him to vote against Ukraine. Minister, please, to make sure that questions and comments are directed through the chair. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Pri Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister demonstrates once again he is a fake and he is a phony. Because he has... He is he's a fake and a...
fake and a phony on this issue, just like on everything else. He sends. Well, the speaker's, uh, he, he cut off the sound and he's trying to stop the chaos from uh, from carrying on. I seen some good comment the other day about forest fires and people starting. I think Walker started. Hi, Walker. Um, if it's the Walker, who knows me? Um, yeah, uh, one thing I want you to look up is Jack Pine. Look up Jack Pine um, about fires. And, and so this is it. Okay. <laughs> I shouldn't say that <laughs> but Jack Pine, Google that. How they you propagate remember, that plant. Again, is a very experienced member, and he knows that when the speaker asks him to, to chastise us a little bit for the use of language which is not considered parliamentary, I'd ask him please to rephrase, uh, with all those comments, rephrase a question without using those words. Mr. Speaker, this is a Prime Minister who authorized the export of gas turbines to pump gas from Putin's economy into Europe to fund the war. He's someone who signed on to allow Russian detonators to blow up Ukrainians on the battlefield, and he's a pro-energy, poli a pro-Russia energy policy to fund the Russian economy. We'll take no less. from the leader of the opposition. The reality is, Prime Minister, the President Zelensky. I see that the, uh, the I see that the, op the opposition uh, House leader is asking members uh, to be calm. I'm going to ask all House leaders to please ask all of your members from all sides to be calm. So, uh, and I'll ask in particular the member from Dufferin Caledon, please, to uh, hold on until he has the time to speak. So, the Honourable Prime Minister, please. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is flailing in every way he can to try and divert the attention from the fact that his members voted against a request by President Zelensky himself to support a Canada-Ukraine free trade deal. The reality is... His uh, constituents across the country feel betrayed by the Conservative Party voting against Ukraine. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The, the Ukrainians asked for us to give missiles that Conservatives support to Ukraine, not to give turbines and detonators to Russia, which is what he has done. He has failed Ukrainians abroad. And he's failed Canadians at home. Canadians are good and decent people. They don't have to live this way. They do not have to give up the things they used to take for granted, like affordable food and homes, all for the incompetence and ego of one man. He is not worth the cost or the corruption. Will he call a carbon tax election so Canadians can decide? Mr. Speaker, notice how desperate he is to try and find any excuse he can to justify their voting against Ukraine. And suddenly, he's not talking about the price on pollution that Ukraine put in itself years ago. He's not using that as an excuse, even though that was all we heard as a justification for why they voted against Ukraine, voted against Ukrainian Canadians, voted against the reconstruction of Ukraine that we are committed to through a free trade agreement. He stood in this house and voted against Ukraine and is now trying to do anything again to hide from it. He let down Ukraine and that shows who he is. Order. Then I have 
The Honourable Member for Ottawa Vanier. Speaker, climate change is a reality that impacts my constituents in Ottawa Vanier. They have asked our, for our government to reduce emissions while putting more money back in their pockets. That is why every year they receive $1,000. I will just ask, well, we'll start again with 10 seconds for the question for the member for Ottawa Vanier, but I would like to ask the member for Jacques Cartier Pontneuf to retain himself while someone is um, asking questions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While Conservative politicians fail to recognize that climate change is real and that there is an even greater cost of inaction, can the Prime Minister inform Canadians why our plan is so important? Here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, I thank the member for Ottawa Vanier for her important question and her hard work. The opposition leader would take away over a thousand dollars from families in Ontario every year. That amount might be minimal to him when he's cashing his CCB check, but not to middle class families. But now we know why he wants to take money away from Canadians. He's in the pocket of big business. We learned from media reports that he was partying with oil lobbyists and CEOs at private cash for access fundraisers in Banff just last year. He cares about his wealthy donors getting richer. He doesn't care about Canadians. The Honourable Member from Nanaimo Ladysmith. Mr. Speaker, families in Nanaimo Ladysmith and across Canada should not have to worry about how to keep their kids fed while at school. A national school food program would make sure kids get the food they, they need to grow and learn. But the Liberals have been delaying for years. And what about the Conservatives? Well, they voted against feeding kids while putting the profits of CEOs first. Children should not be left to go hungry. Will the Prime Minister make sure a national school food program is in the spring budget? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, like all members in this House, uh, they're going to have to wait until October 16th, uh, sorry, April 16th uh, to find out what's in our budget. But I can give people a preview right now. There will be support on housing. There will be help on affordability for Canadians. There will be opportunities to invest in growing the economy and creating good jobs for the future while we help Canadians through tough times right now. We are focused on young people. We are focused on seniors. We're going to keep delivering, including by working with provinces on important programs like uh, school food programs. The Honourable Member from Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, thanks to the powerful advocacy of people with disabilities across the country, every MP in this House supported legislation meant to lift people with disabilities out of poverty. Nine months later, still no commitment from this government to fund what will be called the Canada Disability Benefit. When it came to made legislation, this government sure moved fast to make sure people with disabilities could die well. Will the Prime Minister show he's ready to ensure kids with disabilities Disabilities live well, but Canadians will fully fund and benefit by Budget 2024. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, uh, the member is better than that question that he just asked. Uh, he knows uh, that it's really important to be there to both protect people uh, when they're most vulnerable and uh, be there to support their wishes. That is something that is foundational in Canada. In regards to people living with disabilities, we have uh, invested more in people with disabilities uh, over the past eight years than ever before, and there is more to do. We were very, very pleased to move forward on the Canada Disability Benefit, and we will have more to say in the coming months. It being 323, the House will now proceed to the taking...
I expect a few points of orders. Um, yeah, I put a link in there to the jack pine. Look at how the jack pine propagates. And this is the one thing. Okay, I'm all in for environment and, and making things cleaner, clean water and all that stuff. Is, is anyone who knows me, is, you know. The one thing um, about the forest fires is, is without forest fires, we wouldn't have jack pine. Um, remember the, the indigenous people of of yesterday, yesteryear, um, you know, we're like the Ents. The, they um, tree farmed <clears throat> so that there was more um, acorns uh, than natural, right? Oak, because oak's pretty good with, with uh, um, fire, against fire. So there was all these huge, we have these acorn groves uh, and that thus created lots of deer in these areas because they could eat it. And, and so they did. They did the stewarding uh, of the land and the, and the big fires, and they used fire, all kinds of things. And we're learning about it now with the archaeological digging and um, with AI being able to dig and do do anecdotal uh, to harness anecdotal information. Anyway, that's I'm not against them saying clone change, but that, that's just something to think about because fire without fire we wouldn't have a jack pine. Next time you see a jack pine, remember that it took fire. Anyway. That's besides the point. The the other point is here we're gonna have some point of orders. They're coming up. Um the liberals, I mean the conservatives now, if you look at the the the, the polling map, the whole country is blue. Every province is going to be dominated by a conservative. The only one is it's it's a little bit fifty fifty is the conservative liberal um in Quebec. But the bloc Quebecois are the ones dominating that. And they're uh, conservative leaning ish party, you know, not 100%. They're more progressive conservative, I would call it, consider them. So there's that that's been going on. The the furry news in Newfoundland, the, the fishermen and uh, the fish people are going up. And um, the food, one thing that, that I read about why they're talking about food is um, how do I put this politically correct? There's that song, Flagpola Stagrada. Only stupid people are breeding. Uh, only the poorer people are breeding, and they have trouble feeding their kids more. The educated are having less and less kids. So what they're trying to do is make sure that, you know, um, the ones people that are breeding, because there's, there's not enough people breeding, at least the kids that are growing up are having 110% um, uh, background because, you know, if you're having three kids nowadays, you're probably not going to be able to afford the food unless you make over $120,000 a year. And they know that's going to come. Now, if you have starving kids in Canada, um, you, you'll never get elected again. So they're they're preemptively protecting the, the lowest income people who are the ones that are breeding the most. I don't know how else to put this. Creating families are the lowest income bracket. Flagpole is Glada. So let's listen to the point of orders and not listen to my jargon. Thank you for watching. And oh, and uh, there's another thing coming up. Um, we have uh, Yves Gos, uh, yeah, Yves Gosset, a liberal MP. He's going to be grilled, and that's coming up um, shortly. Check this out. Let's. Oh, and the and the carbon tax debate. They're going to debate about this carbon tax, which. The conservatives are saying they're bringing it to no confidence. If you've watched this last hour, that's basically Pierre Polliver's um, uh, whole spiel for the day. Imagine if you have more kids, less immigration is needed. Yeah, that's true, Jesse. Uh, it's just not happening, right? Um, and and the, the people that are coming into the country are, are less educated and less likely to have a decent enough wage, and they're going to have trouble eating. This is the report I read. It's like they're preempting this. They're going to have trouble feeding their kids and um, as disparity if this continues, if this inflation continues, that is. Let's hope it ends. And if we uh, – another one was – another report was like if this country continues to go in debt, we don't need to worry. They're, we're just going to have to rip out all of our trees, uh, mine our resources, and have a little bit uh, uh, a very ugly, hideous uh, countryside. And, but we'll be able to pay it off. So fret not. We can look. That's that's the report I read. I don't know what the hell that means. And uh, oh oh, it looks like it's a bit bit of a giggle. Oh, there, there we go. We have the MPE there that's studying with his headphones on. Uh, Yves Glochette. Uh, sorry, I'm 
Practicing. All right. I would like to thank the Honourable Member for Botton of Jacques Cartier. There's an order from the House of Commons. I would ask all members. Order, please. What I was explaining to the member for Bonneville Jacques Cartier, who is rising on a point of privilege, is that the House has made a decision to move straight to the vote. We will have a vote, after which we can entertain questions of privilege. This is after the vote. At the, this was at the request of the House of Commons. So we will have the vote immediately. So we will have the opportunity to talk after the vote. Once again, it being 3.23 p.m., the House will now proceed to the taking of the deferred recorded division on the motion to concur in the fifth report of the Standing Committee on Science and Research. Call in the members. Okay, so it's the voting on this, and here we go. Well, they're on it. Scientific publication in French is the vote. It looks like this is going to carry on for some time. And, uh, well, um, I'm going to keep the feed going and, uh, for 10 minutes or so we can watch, you know, we can watch the characters or the actors, um, in, in this political mishmash of Canada. Mr. Leslie. Mr. Leslie. Mr. Majumdar. Mr. Majumdar. Monsieur Therrien. Monsieur Therrien. Madame Normandin. Madame Normandin. Monsieur Simard. Monsieur Simard. Monsieur Garon. Monsieur Garon. Madame de Bellefeuille. Madame de Bellefeuille. Monsieur Villemur. Monsieur Villemur. Monsieur Terrio. Monsieur Terrio. Madame Gaudreau. Madame Gaudreau. Madame Larouche. Madame Larouche. Madame Vignola. Madame Vignola. Madame Posé. Madame Posé. Monsieur Champoux. Monsieur Champoux. Monsieur Beaulieu. Monsieur Beaulieu. Monsieur Lemire. Monsieur Lemire. Madame Chabot. Madame Chabot. Monsieur Trudel. Monsieur Trudel. Madame Berube. Madame Berube. Monsieur Désilet. Monsieur Désilet. Mr. Julian. Mr. Julian. Ms. Collins Victoria. Ms. Collins Victoria. Ms. Blaney. Ms. Blaney. Mr. McGregor. Mr. McGregor. Ms. Zarillo. Ms. Zarillo. Mr. Garrison. Mr. Garrison. Madame Hughes. Madame Hughes. Mr. Canning. Mr. Canning. Ms. Matheson. Ms. Matheson. Mr. Desjardins. Mr. Desjardins. Ms. McPherson. Ms. McPherson. Mr. Blakey. Mr. Blakey. Ms. May Sandwich Gulf Islands. Ms. May Sandwich Gulf Islands. Mr. Morris. Mr. Morris. Mr. Vaughn. Mr. Vaughn. All those opposed to the motion will please rise. The House will now wait for the electronic voting period to end before resuming its proceedings. Okay, well, that's what we have, and um, there's no other committees. I'm going to go to a playing of this here. Here, let's look at this. Silk.
I have no knowledge of that. The Dow didn't provide funds to GC Strategies. I have no knowledge of that. Do you know if Butler got paid for their services through GC Strategies or through Dow I have no knowledge of that. Thank you, Mr. Souza. Uh, colleagues, I apologize. I skipped over the uh, conservative round, so we will all go to. I was so anxious to hear from Mr. Souza. <laughs> You caught me uh, off guard, too. Yeah, sorry. So we're going to go to Mr. Brock, and then we'll go to uh, Mr. Genuis and Mr. Uh, Shawari to finish. And then uh, the Block NDP. Go ahead, Mr. Brock. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Anthony, do you currently have or have you had in the past any relatives working with uh, the Government of Canada? No. All right. Uh, you'd agree with me, sir. I'm going to ask you a number of uh, rapid fire questions. You'd agree with me, sir, that Christian Firth really is the sole public face of Government of Canada strategies. No. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, Mr. Sousa. I don't believe it's called Government of Canada GC Strategies. Order. I think that's the name no. of the company. Yeah, we've, already, a, we've already read, resolved yeah, that. Yeah, it's not a point of order, uh, Mr. Sousa, but thanks. Mr. Brock, continue, sir. Um, are you a public face? Uh, I might be now. <laughs> you probably are. Yeah, uh, that, that's, a, that's a good observation. But you'd agree with me that uh, Mr. Firth was front and center during the rollout of the Arrive Scam app over the last several years. It wasn't you, it was Mr. Firth, correct? He, he was the face for Arrive yes, Scam, yes. Yes, he was the one that held all the relationships with the bureaucrats and government officials such as deputy ministers and ministers, not you, correct? I don't have any knowledge of that. He was the one that was whining and dining uh, potential contractors with government officials. That wasn't you, correct? That wasn't me. No. Literally everything to do with the Arrive Can scam was flowed directly through Christian Firth. It had no DNA of you on it. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I was not involved. Right. So we heard yesterday from Christian Firth that uh, not only yesterday, but in previous testimony, that he's quite proud of the Arrive Can scam. Are you equally proud? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm proud of the work that, that we were able to deliver. Are you proud of the end result? Which end result are you referring to? The end result that resulted in uh, uh, extremely long delays at the borders, chaos and confusion. Relating to the business of supply. The question is as follows. Mr. Scheer, seconded by Mr. Stanley, moved that given seven, that 70% of provinces and 70% of Canadians oppose the Prime Minister's 23% carbon tax hike on April 1st, the House call on the NDP Liberal Coalition to immediately cancel this hike. The 10-minute period for members voting electronically has started, and the House will now proceed to the vote for members participating in person. All those in favor of the motion will please rise. Mr. Schmail. Mr. Schmail. Mr. Bazan. Mr. Bazan. Mr. Commit. Mr. Commit. Mr. Birkin. Mr. Birkin. Mrs. Thomas. Mrs. Thomas. Mr. Deltel. Mr. Deltel. Mrs. Stubbs. Mrs. Stubbs. Mr. Polus. Mr. Polus. Mr. Upal. Mr. Upal. Ms. Lewis Haldeman Norfolk. Ms. Lewis Haldeman Norfolk. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Gray. Mrs. Gray. Mr. Barlow. Mr. Barlow. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore. Mr. Ellis. Mr. Ellis. Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly. Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper. Mr. Hoback. Mr. Hoback. Mr. Davidson. Mr. Davidson. Mr. Jenis. Mr. Jenis. Mr. Small. Mr. Small. Mr. Brock. Mr. Brock. Mr. Bertold. Mr. Bertold. Madame Finley. Miss Finley. Mr. Aboutayev. Mr. Aboutayev. Mrs. Cousy. Mrs. Cousy. Mr. Seabag. Mr. Seabag. Ms. Ferrari. Ms. Ferrari. Mrs. Block. Mrs. Block. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Straw. Mr. Straw. Mr. Viss. Mr. Viss. Mr. Doherty. Mr. Doherty. Mr. Macaulay, 
Edmonton West. Mr. McCauley, Edmonton West. Mr. Lloyd. Mr. Lloyd. Mr. Brassard. Mr. Brassard. Mrs. Goodridge. Mrs. Goodridge. Mr. Godin. Mr. Godin. Madame Vien. Madame Vien. Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams. Mr. Melillo. Mr. Melillo. Mr. Tucker. Mr. Tucker. Mr. Chambers. Mr. Chambers. Mrs. Cramp Nyman. Mrs. Cramp Nyman. Mrs. Roberts. Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Patzer. Mr. Patzer. Mrs. Gallant. Mrs. Gallant. Mr. Muse. Mr. Muse. Mr. Redekop. Mr. Redekop. Mr. Van Popta. Mr. Van Popta. Mr. Wa. Mr. Wa. Mr. Culkin. Mr. Culkin. Mr. Lou. Mr. Lou. Mr. Genereux. Mr. Genereux. Mr. Law. Mr. Law. Mr. Mazur. Mr. Mazur. Mrs. Vecchio. Mrs. Vecchio. Mr. Kirk. Mr. Kirk. Mr. Epp. Mr. Epp. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Dreesen. Mr. Dreesen. Mr. Kitchen. Mr. Kitchen. Mr. Cram. Mr. Cram. Mr. Tolmy. Mr. Tolmy. Mrs. Wagenthal. Mrs. Wagenthal. Mrs. Falk, Battleford Lloyd Minster. Mrs. Falk, Battleford Lloyd Minster. Mr. Bragdon. Mr. Bragdon. Mr. Nader. Mr. Nader. Mr. Soroka. Mr. Soroka. Mr. McLean. Mr. McLean. Mr. Shipley. Mr. Shipley. Mr. McGuire. Mr. McGuire. Mr. Reed. Mr. Reed. Mr. Shield. Mr. Shield. Mr. Falk Provence. Mr. Falk Provence. Mr. Mott. Mr. Mott. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. D'Antremont. Mr. D'Antremont. Mr. Morrison. Mr. Morrison. Mr. Dowdle. Mr. Dowdle. Mr. Albus. Mr. Albus. Mr. Carey. Mr. Carey. Mr. Weber. Mr. Weber. Mr. Fast. Mr. Fast. Mr. Leslie. Mr. Leslie. Mr. Vaughn. Mr. Vaughn. Could you so? All those opposed to the motion will please rise. Mr. McKinnon Gatineau. Mr. McKinnon Gatineau. Mr. Sajan. Mr. Sajan. Ms. Tassie. Ms. Tassie. Ms. Sachs. Ms. Sachs. Ms. Chagger. Ms. Chagger. Ms. Murray. Ms. Murray. Ms. Scro. Ms. Scro. Mr. Scarpaleggia. Mr. Scarpaleggia. Mr. Casey. Mr. Casey. Ms. Cara. Ms. Cara. Madame Saint Ange. Madame Saint Ange. Ms. Qualtro. Ms. Qualtro. Ms. Sahota. Ms. Sahota. Madame Petit Pas Taylor. Madame Petit Pas Taylor. Madame Martinez Ferrada. Madame Martinez Ferrada. Mr. Dollywa. Mr. Dollywa. Mr. Arsenault. Mr. Arsenault. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Got some, um, I don't know if this is breaking news, but some news out of, <clears throat> I don't know, the CBC, I'm scouring it while they're doing their vote. These are the nays of the carbon tax ending. The description is in the description, <laughs> what they're voting on exactly. So this is, um, okay, the title is Landmark U.S. Settlement Could Impact Canadian Housing Market. Now, one thing about the, the, the Liberal Housing Plan is they stopped foreign investors from being able to buy in certain markets. Those are the hot markets. So what happened is, is basically they destroyed all the smaller markets where poor people like me would, would move to, to a smaller town, um, or less economy. Well, those houses, they were reasonable. Now they're not. There's nowhere in Canada now because, because they tried to help Toronto and areas, so they screwed everybody else. This is, this is liberal policy, eh? Fail to plan. You're a fucking idiot. There's just that sort of part of my French. I'm I'm really upset about that stupid plan. It's, it was obviously is is going to happen. Well, if they can't invest in this town, they're going to go and invest in these other towns, screwing everybody who's like you know now now what homes were like in some areas fifty thousand now they're like two hundred thousand because the investors have descended upon these other markets. So we, basically, they've created the bubble all across Canada. And then they took away the temperature pressure valve. You know, the little thing on the top of your hot water tank goes pss, pss, when the pressure gets too high. Well, they took that away. So investors can can descend on less profitable areas of the housing market. Yeah, you know, it's just, just the, the worst policy I could imagine was that one. As soon as I see that, I was like, oh, my God. So anyway, there's my rant. Substantial settlement recently announced by a U.S. group representing more than one million realtors as real estate experts hopeful Canadian home sellers could soon get a better deal. Last week, the U.S.-based National Association of Realtors agreed to pay $418 million U.S. to end legal claims for from home sellers that argued the group artificially inflated real estate concessions. 
Okay, so this landmark settlement in the U.S. is playing out in the same time as proposed national class action suit makes its way through the Canadian courts, with the lawyer behind it, the claim, saying a win would reduce the cost of Canadian homes. It won't. Um, no way. It's going to revolutionize the practice of real estate, uh, another professor said. It may become more competitive, but more importantly, cheaper for people to sell their homes. So basically, they're going to let other regular people sell their own homes. Is that the idea, I think, is what's happening here? So the for decades, the U.S. case has required brokers. Oh, OK, sorry. Let's listen to the, the House of Commons. La Chambre. The House will now wait for the end of the electronic voting period before resuming its proceedings. Okay. All right. So yeah, they're, they're doing a few minutes, another another five more minutes of electronic. Okay, two minutes left of the, uh, and then they're back in the parliament. And so this article goes on as part of the settlement. The you know NAR has agreed to stop the practice. Okay, the the. Okay, sorry. This is the 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 practice. The NAR has required brokers listing homes for sale to make. A commission offer to a buyer's agent up front, typically about 6% of the sale price split between the seller's broker and the seller's agent. Okay, so they each get 3% off of the sale of a home, $100,000. They get 3%. There they get 3 3 There you go. So this is basically trying to trim a little bit off of um, the people that sell your house. Um, they have kind of a, sh a, a tough job. They don't know if they're going to make money. How much effort are they going to put into it if they're cutting it off? Uh, I, I think this is just nipping at the edges, to be honest. I'm not going to finish reading this article. Gibberish. It's just nipping at the outside. When your house has increased triple in price, that, that what the realtor is making on it is, you know, very negligible. It's actually um, a no-brainer. No there's only one way to uh, lower the prices. That's overbuild. They need to overbuild, and that can create a bubble, right? Because who the hell wants to buy a home built in 1970 when they can buy a home for a reasonable price that's brand new? But new homes are huge. They're monoliths. They're just, just huge homes because that's what where the – and I don't blame the companies. The companies are there to make money, and um, these homes are just very large. <clears throat> Though uh, – if this guy, I personally, I think, okay, they need 2.4 million homes today. The only thing that makes sense is you build high rises. You build high rises. I, you, you go into neighborhoods now, young families, they have gardens. The guy's only outside, in, or the wife now, uh, outside to cut their grass. They don't actually, people are, aren't the same as they were in the 50s as outdoorsy people. Uh, computers are way better. Oh, that was a good one. Um, 25 seconds left. Oh, actually, it's paused at 25 seconds. <laughs> so 25 seconds, and we're back. But the housing, um, they, they, they need to put hundreds of billions of dollars into it. And this is the one thing I always laugh at when people are saying, why are you giving money to this place? It's as if they're going to give it to you. It's not like if they give money to Ukraine, they're going to give it to, to plebs of Canada. <laughs> like, that's not, not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. You know? Uh, we haven't had any governments that actually help the people. Um, they help businesses. They help the, the what did Pierre call them, the already landed. Um, just this regular working folk are never, have never been substantially helped uh, in, in Canada, except that one time when they did that thing. When was it in the, the 60s? Um, healthcare. Uh, and uh, the windfall came from a lot of doctors. We we got more doctors and educated class from that day because more people could afford to go to the hospital because they didn't have to pay. All right, it's just coming back on the carbon tax. I just I don't have any uh, hope that the that this budget will do a thing. To be honest, it's very cynical of me, but. I wish to inform the House no. that the electronic voting period has ended. Okay, back. If members were not able to vote due to technical difficulties, they may now use the raise hand function and the chair will recognize them. The table will now compile the results of the vote.
Yeah. Pool, 119 Saint Nays Pool, 205 I declare the motion defeated. La Chambre procédera. The House will now proceed to the taking of the deferred recorded division on the motion of Mr. Scheer relating to the business. Uh, sorry, on vote C365 under private members' business at second reading. The vote question is as follows. Paul the Norfolk moved that Bill C365, an act respecting the implementation of a consumer-led banking system for Canadians, be now read a second time and referred to the Standing Committee of Finance. The 10-minute period for members voting uh, electronically has started, and the House will now proceed to the vote. We will start with the sponsor of the item. Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams. We will now proceed uh, to members uh, participating in person. All those at my left in favor of the motion will please rise. Um, I personally think that um, when you, this is my opinion now, who knows, right? But uh, someone says the budget would kill us, uh, Mike Tremblay. I believe that um, when you have people homeless and uh, homeless, like, you know what I mean? They don't give as much effort. They won't work as hard. So you've basically, you're eliminating that person um, to contributing more because they're like, basically like, well, I can't afford a home. Why would I bother? And now when you do this uh, by millions of people, th th this is this number I believe is huge. Um, and, and this is another thing that's that's never talked about very much. But people who own homes have a sense of something called community. When you're a renter, you don't have as much of a sense of community, um, especially if you've moved to that area. And the more people that are either homeless or just renting, is th the more you're going to see this problem grow. And uh, if you want to have someone volunteer their time, money, and effort, uh, first of all, they have to have a home. They have to have a stake in the community. If they don't get a stake, you're just creating bigger problems and... Um, and I get it that, that the money, uh, the thing is, the thing is, is that the problem is, is uh, that they give money to, to millionaires all the time and no one bats an eye. No conservative, no liberal, no NDP bat, well, maybe a couple couple MPs, uh, uh, you know, but they're always backbenchers complain about money going to millionaires or billionaires. But the, the, the focus needs to, first of all, stop pull, pulling money permits off the plebs. This is what the plan of this is what carbon tax is. They need money, so if they get a dollar from everybody, it's easy. Well, the thing is, is a dollar from everybody is is uh, the people who need homes right now. So stop the the funds, any funds going towards um, pulling money out of it. It's a housing crisis. We're not in like a a housing issue, or it's called a housing crisis because it's it's actually a problem. Uh, Twenty, thirty years in the making. It doesn't need to be a program that goes on forever. You just need to to ramp up 2.4 million homes. Um, you know, I mean, they did this before, wartime housing. And the reason why they did it before, it wasn't any reason of empathy or they give a shh about regular folk, is that there was a lot of military-aged individuals who just fought a war, who had a spree de corps with a bunch of their, their buddies from overseas, and they were the politicians were scared shitless of them. If they didn't have a home, they came back. They couldn't afford a home, and they were homeless. The nation would have been would have burned. I guarantee it would have burned. And uh, that that's the only thing that the only in my opinion, the only reason why they did that was fear. Politicians feared what would happen because they you know because of what happened. So they helped the homes. And now wartime homes, you know, they're common. Uh, every town kind of has it, and it was a good plan. And ninety percent of Canadians approve of the wartime housing so you tell me well we got 70 percent of canadians against the carbon tax but 90 percent for their homes so talk about a good policy you know for me that's that's it okay here we go around the yeas uh this is the i think the last vote and this is my opinion I have a committed community. No, oh, see, look, yeah, see, I like that one. He says, "I have I have I committed to my community?" Um, no. Who who said that? It, it went fast. Yeah, Mike Tremblay. I'm a renter in the same area for nine years. I have committed community to. Oh, okay. You've committed to your community. You've you've helped. That's nice. Uh, just got here. Luke says. 
they do the confidence vote? If so, it passed. No, the the confidence vote is going to be tomorrow. The conf- the vote on carbon tax, which is the pre one, is today. But now there's going to be another one tomorrow. The announcement was today, and the other vote tomorrow. But there's a carbon tax vote that just happened. <laughs> if this makes sense. Um, they're basically the the conservatives are doubling up on their carbon tax bills this week. Wartime um, Christina Rose uh, Wartime Housing received property rights a, a yard. I don't understand that. Sorry. Just wonder if they really protested April first and they use another legal emergency act. Um, I don't think anyone's going to protest um, on this. It's not a big enough one. It's not um, in the last one. Uh, they're on the nays here. The block is no surprise, but the NDP need to receive tons of pressure. Yeah. Yeah, war, wartime housing received property rights. Um, I'm not sure. Rural. I'm renter for same. Oh yeah, this is sorry. This has been going on. Thank you, Akasha Oftenil Nile. Yeah, the the carbon tax. The one thing is, is that uh, they they spent more money. Remember, the liberals spent more money in the pandemic than we did, uh, like dollar for dollar. Uh, you know, when inflation included than we did in World War II. And think of all the products we got out of World War II. Now, we blew up those products and destroyed a lot of them. But think about the ships. There's aircraft carriers. We built things. This one gave money to businesses. And who owns businesses? It's the wealthy people. And it's not all wealthy. And, and, and a lot of them, this is the problem, is a lot of them got sucked in too. And lot, a lot of people lost their business. But the fact was is they shut business down and then they funded them. Um, 75 over, at least from what I checked, 75% of the money that went to this pandemic went to already wealthy people. And it was just cash. So, so don't talk. It's the inflation is exactly that. Now, you, you can debate on, okay, what else were they going to do, right? They told people to stay home, right? But I don't think they should have given the wealthy people as much money. I think the, 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 they could have done other avenues to alleviate the tax burden or the, or the loan burden, put everything on hold. I don't know. I really don't know, to be honest. It was a conundrum. But um, the 75% went to wealthy individuals. And what happened? We've had inflation. And basically, everything got worse because of that. Um, And now it's time to fix that problem that they made by fixing a problem. (laughs) Uh, And they're not going to. Uh, That's what everyone's saying. I have no knowledge of. Okay, so. Here, I'll put up this guy here. Um, I'm going to read something else here. Hard times are coming. I think hard times, but they're getting better. Um, all the manufacturing is. You're welcome. Um, all, all the manufacturing is coming back. Christina Rose sold a wartime property what your 14th home it was a sliver of land but it was theirs yeah yeah well the thing is is um most people in the first home they don't want a monolith big home they they can't afford it as much and 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 if you want to make money um the the developers would make more money off larger homes um and so that's what they're doing they have to be in set companies and i don't expect a company to be the savior of home of the housing crisis why would you I personally that's not what capitalism is for but you have to incentivize i believe the government's job is to incentivize people to fix the businesses to fix the problem because i don't think government's going to do it government employees we, we see how they work but um if you incentivize businesses to build small homes and this and that, then they'll, they'll do it and it'll happen but this is not what's happening we have um so far the plan has been to give politicians money politicians give politicians money to give to developers and 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 that's never worked you know that's only worked you know it's called the manila envelope people are what is this people are led to believe that it is theirs it's not
EVs are coming. Um, I think EVs are on their way. John Matrix, just take mortgages. Five percent of two hundred thousand is ten thousand. So two hundred and ten thousand for your mortgage over twenty five years and make payments of seven hundred dollars a month. Yet it'll end up costing you, yeah, twelve to to thirteen hundred a month when you people are gonna wake up. Yeah, and that's just the beginning. Um, it's actually not too bad. Uh, it's just getting the down payment and proving that you can pay your payments. Two hundred thousand isn't a bad for for wages now, but it, it's not that here. Um, here is you're looking at uh, five hundred thousand. There, there are the odd house of that, but five hundred is really the baseline. So you know you're looking at twenty six hundred a month, um, and then you got your water bills and all that taxes, and the. 18 to interest on a mortgage was 21%. Imagine that. Eh? Wow. That was another problem time. Remember in the 80s? Yeah, immigration. Immigration is the major, is the driver of this problem. Um, and if they, if we had a good government, I, I, we need immigration. That's a problem. But the government, we're like, okay, we're going to fix a problem. Well, let's not alleviate. They, they, they fixed the problem without looking at the problems that they created and and looking at, hey, how do we solve these problems that we're creating? Ah, who cares? Ax these people. Tax them more. We'll bring it on. Yeah, first wave of Trudeau's had wicked interest rates. Yeah, there's, there's, there's nothing. And this is the problem. The problem is with this stupid liberal plan that they stopped investors being able to invest in hot markets now there's nowhere you can go. Like there used to be places in Manitoba you can find a twenty five thousand dollar homes. They're gone. It's because they've been all bought by investors, all investors. And then the basically what they have to do is they have to solve the problem. Investors are the problem. You know, we want investors in our market, but right now we need to fix it. Number two, we have too many immigrants, not enough building. Okay, so we'd slow down the immigrants. Number three, we're not building enough homes that are the right size for the people who want a home. Well, incentivize the businesses. Like, wow, is this really hard? One, two, three? Is that, I just, you know, but I believe, I believe that this government is worried about a housing crash because Canada has the largest bubble in the country. And they're more worried about the wealthy individuals who vote, by the way, or elderly, um, losing the value of their homes than they are about the youth who aren't as high voters. In my opinion, they just that's just the bottom line. And they're never going to fix it. They're just, they're just not going to fix the housing problem because the people who vote are not important because they don't vote. All right. Okay, they're back. Here's my rant. Order about a vote. The Honorable Minister for Seniors. The difficulties with the app, I ran back as soon as I could, and I'm hoping that uh, there's unanimous consent to have my vote counted in favor. Could you, sir, keep support? All those opposed to the Honorable Members moving the motion will please say nay. Accordingly, the House has heard the terms of the motion. All those opposed to the motion will please say nay. Adopté. Monsieur le... Just in a moment, I'll just finish. I wish to inform the House that due to the deferred recorded divisions, government orders will be extended by 36 minutes. The Honorable Member for Terre-Neuve, Chaque Cartier, on a point of privilege. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, there is a point of privilege. Today is Francophonie Day, and so it's very unfortunate that this has happened. I am raising today a question of privilege about the Liberals' chaotic attempt to amend the NDP opposition motion from Monday. On Monday night, when there was only one minute left in debate, the government parliamentary house leader moved a lengthy, complex, and unilingual amendment. After that, there were lengthy procedural debates, as you know. But since the amendment was only available in English, Francophone members were not able to fully participate in deliberations. Additionally, due to translation delays, the members were not able to examine the amendment in French until right before the vote. 
in my opinion, the government's conduct obstructs the capacity of Francophone members to participate in the work of the House. This is so serious that I believe it constitutes a breach of privilege. According to House of Commons Procedure and Practice, 3rd edition, it says that a member can also face interference in the exercise of their functions through non-physical methods. In judging this type of situation, the speaker must judge the impact of the situation on members' ability to carry out their parliamentary responsibilities. If the chair believes that parliamentary responsibilities may have been violated, it is impossible to codify all incidents that could be considered as being cases of interference obstruction, brutality, or bullying, and which ultimately constitute a prima facie case of privilege. We have the absolute constitutional right to use either official language in parliamentary procedure, proceedings rather. Therefore, the fact that the House leader, who is from Quebec in addition, his actions reduced Quebec Francophone members' ability to participate in important procedural debate. The Honorable Member for Gatineau has, all, has ended up making Francophone members here second tier members. In Standing Order 65, it says that a. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm pausing this to interject. Um, Wild Edibles lives up north. I think, believe you live up north by the way I've seen your pictures. Mom says, my house in Ontario was worth the same forever. Now it is ballooned. And the reason why it's ballooned, part of the reason, is the liberals cut off of the – see, investors usually invest in certain markets, and markets are AOR, area of responsibility. Toronto market, Markham, you know, um, has always been hot. Vancouver, Calgary, this is where they invest, and uh, investors have always done it because um, – the cities themselves are geared and, and ready for it, never mind all the other things. Um, well, what happened is the Liberals made a plan in their in their housing plan policy, the law that they that was voted on and passed. They, they said um, they're cutting investors out of the hot markets, so Toronto, Vancouver. So instantly, it's not like they stopped investing. Um, they just invested into the small towns. So all the small towns, the, the, you're having the same problem that Toronto did, and it's only going to get worse because there's less homes in smaller communities. Um, so it can happen like in, in five minutes. It can buy the, the 30 homes that are for sale, and uh, the home next home the next day that will go up, well, they'll, they'll just jack the price up 30%, 40%. That's how fast it happens. And this is what happens when you have a government meddling with stuff, and they just don't care about anyone but the investors. They're, they're investor-centric government and wealthy class. But this isn't... This is an investor pro is not an investor problem. We're gonna have the investors no matter what we do to them. Because hey, were you gonna invest in Russia? If you're in Russia right now, do you think that people are invest Russian rich Russians are investing in Russia? Fuck no. They're investing here. They're like, if if shit goes downhill, I'm flying to Canada. And there's all these Chinese people right now. They're like, if shit goes downhill, I'm flying to Canada, India, uh, Philippines, all around the world. We're the safe place. Like it or not, and America is out. You know, is usually number one. But we're, we've been very, um, we've been looked at since the pandemic is the number one place if sh hits the fan. And uh, so we don't need to worry about investors. We need to. The, the problem is called the housing crisis of the people. It's not of investors. So the liberals are concerned about investors, the investor class, and uh, and they've, they basically just they're helping make the problem worse. <laughs> it's the worst part. And the conservatives, in my opinion, are not doing a very good job articulating the problems that they've created. That they're they're on carbon tax because it's visible, but the housing crisis is created by the liberals, in my opinion. And they can be solved by them, but that's my my. Okay, here we got exactly. Let's escape to Canada. Well, that's what everyone's doing, and then and, and I don't blame them. We should be embracing that and having a build up in Canada. Having in a, oh yes, 
invest your your park your um land in uh, your your investment in Canada. But you have to have a building boom to create that because we have people that have homes anyway. And they didn't do any. They didn't make any um caveats nothing f- for the people it was all for to help the investors and they're worried about the bubble and of course you know at the same time uh it, there's no on-ramp to get into home and in my area is five hundred thousand. I, I don't even want to buy a home five hundred thousand dollars for for a home that needs rentals is just ridiculous i don't care what my wages are it just um it just you know and and now you can't even go three hours up north because, like Wild Edibles says, her house you know, doubled, tripled in price. It, this happened in a few months really quickly. A motion must be tabled in written form before it is put to the vote. When the motion is carried, it must be read out in English and in French. If the chair is able to use both languages, if not, we'll read it in one language and the clerk will read it in the other before it be placed for debate. But unfortunately, neither the chair nor the clerk were able to read the amendment in French because it didn't exist in French. It's a crying shame. This is shocking. For a country that's officially bilingual, it is in fact embarrassing. The use of both official languages, French and English, for those who don't remember it, has had constitutional standing here since Confederation. If you agree, Mr. Speaker, that this is a prima facie breach of privilege, I am ready to present the appropriate motion. Thank you for your attention. I see the parliamentary secretary rising on the same point of privilege. Mr. Speaker, given the nature of the uh, privilege the member has raised, I would take it uh, as notice and report, uh, provide comment uh, uh, in a relatively quick uh, time span for you to make a decision. On the same point of privilege, the honorable member for La Prairie, Mr. Speaker, I would just like to add that the Bloc Québécois reserves the right to make remarks later after properly analyzing the situation that was mentioned by my colleague from the Conservative Party. The member for Mégantique l'érable rising on the same point of privilege. Yes, I would just like to add a few points to my colleague for Port Neuf, Jacques Cartier's point of privilege to assist in your reflection on the decision to take on this matter. With the adoption of the British North America Act, the greatest leg- legacy of Sir John A. Macdonald and jean jacques Cartier, according to this, members may express themselves in the official language of their choice, and they have been able to do this since the very first sitting of this parliament. Later, the Translation Bureau was created in 1934 after a stormy debate. The Bureau was asked to cooperate with both chambers of parliament and to act on their behalf on translation. Later, under the Diefenbaker government, simultaneous interpretation was introduced to the chambers of parliament. After a commitment made in 1958 by the Progressive Conservative Party in its, in its election agenda, And at the time, ironically, some liberals were against that change. Professor Jean Delisle, in an article about the 50th anniversary of simultaneous integration in Parliament, said that even Lester B. Pearson was against it at the time, but that opposition disappeared when Prime Minister Diefenbaker asked the House to approve the measures. More recently, under Brian Mulroney, a great statesman on whose legacy of whose legacy we recently spoke after his after his decease, the Official Languages Act that we currently have was brought in. It's a quasi-constitutional piece of legislation, and it made simultaneous interpretation in this House a right. It goes without saying that parliamentary bilingualism is a, leg- is a legacy that conservatives are proud of. This liberal NDP coalition government doesn't seem to give a fig about this tradition. But we must draw a clear red line against further erosion of the French language in the House of Commons. 
On the same point, I see that the Honourable Member from Sherwood Park, uh, Fort Saskatchewan, is rising on his feet. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to add my comments and agree with the question of privilege that was raised. Mr. Speaker, in general, what happened on Monday night was a gross and disgusting violation of the principle of, of, of this House being a deliberative assembly of members. The fact that the government uh, put forward a last-minute, very substantive amendment that was not at all debated in this House is, is disgusting and would not be acceptable in any legislature around the world. Uh, it was particularly unfair for the reasons my colleague explained uh, to our Francophone colleagues because of the lack of, of uh, translation available. Uh, in general, the timeline and the process presented by this government seem to try to reduce Parliament to pageantry and theatre rather than recognize our substantive role as the deliberative assembly of one nation in both official languages. Uh, this was uh, wrong and unfair in general, but it was particularly unfair to our Francophone colleagues, and I hope you'll find in favour of this question of privilege. I greatly appreciate all the remarks. What I can say is that given the general interest in this question of privilege and to ensure that the chair will come to a ruling that reflects the concerns raised, especially by the member for Pont neuf jacques as well as several colleagues in the House. I would like to inform members that the chair has heard the substantive material of what was expressed and that I will shortly return with a ruling. Thank you. Very quickly, because as I said, the chair has heard a great deal on this, and it will all be integrated into our perspective. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint very quickly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, indeed, as a Francophone and proud representative of Louis Saint a Francophone writing in Confederation, I was very insulted about the fact that I had to vote on a text that was entirely in English. But what I wanted to say is that the opposition's parliamentary leader, House leader, gave an alternative saying that we could delay the vote so that the tr translation could be done pro properly. So we did give an option, a recommendation, but the government didn't agree, and that's a real shame. Thank you very much. On this point of order, uh, from uh, Lanark, <laughs> from Lanark, uh, uh, Kingston, uh, I, I just want to let the member know that I have heard uh, a number of points on this issue. The, the chair is satisfied that he's heard the, the, the full range of to make an important decision on this issue. It is one uh, in which. I'll ask the member to be very brief. This will be the last point of order which is going to be uh, heard by the chair on this point. The honourable member from. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do appreciate that. What I wanted to point out is something that I think is highly relevant but has not been mentioned in the previous submissions to you, and I think will be of use to you in, in coming to a decision. It's just this point. We do know that it was one minute, more or less, before the end of the debate that this point, that th this was raised. Oh, five minutes, fine, uh, I'm told. The point is this: uh, if you, nor in the normal course of business, you present. Some, a motion in one language only. You do not stop the proceedings for an hour, as actually happened, giving the opportunity for the second language to be produced. You would return to the debate, and if they can get the matter to you in both languages prior to the expiration of the de debate, then you'd end things. You do not halt things and allow them to get around to producing things at their convenience. I think that rule would indicate that the wrong approach was taken here, and your guidance in your ruling for future uh, uh, situations of the same sort would be most helpful. Thank you. I thank the honourable member from the next Frontenac, Addington, uh, Kingston, rather, uh, for uh, this matter, uh, for raising that point, and the chair will come back to this house. Proceedings. Depot de documents. Tabling of documents. It is my duty to lay upon the table, pursuant to Section 536 of the Canada Elections Act, the report of the Chief Electoral Officer of Canada 
on the 2023 by-elections. Pursuant to Standing Order 1083A, this report is deemed permanently referred to the Standing Committee on Procedure and House Affairs. De la Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 368A, I have the honour to table in both official languages the government's responses uh, to 18 petitions. These returns will be tabled in an electronic format. Introduction of government bills. Monsieur Leblanc. All right, a special treat for you uh, people. Um, we're going to keep on going and to keep the feed going. Um, y, uh, MP Yves Duclos, uh, a liberal MP Duclos, MP Duclos, is, uh, uh, he, he's in the hot seat. He's getting a grilling by the Conservatives in six minutes. Um, so that should be starting. We're going to watch this, see where these... Uh, where this is going, um, these proceedings, what 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 new bills or whatever they were they're putting in, and then we're gonna jump right over there in a few minutes. Um, I like the comments. I found it was uh, it what was removed. Um, yeah, there's there's an automatic removal of some comment. I I am not a hundred percent in control of the comments anymore. I don't know if I ever was, but now that I'm I'm verify everything. Um, some of them are gone. Some of mine. Listen. And it's not and that's not just anybody. My comments get um, um, filtered sometimes. So, you know, it's buckwheat. Buckwheat. Look at this gremlin. Oh, uh, Kevin, you're probably talking about. Uh, if it were cost effective, companies in Canada would be doing it. Um, Pure Knight doesn't like Fergus. I, I, I think he's a uh, thing. Uh, Saturday, Sri Lanka today, Ki Kalahai. I don't know. <laughs> Cornstar just said, uh, "Some Cornstar, have you seen the guy in Minnesota? He has a greenhouse that's set partially in the ground, grows oranges. I want to try it. Oh, okay, I know what. Um, uh, Jilly Jilly Mac, Jilly Mac is talking about. It's actually um, the way to do this is is uh, I can't remember the name. Arctic greenhousing, um, China." Is way ahead of us in it because remember China doesn't have you know they have they have weather like us too, and you can buy the kits uh, from Alibaba, I don't, you know Alibaba has the the kits their their winter greenhouses whatever Arctic greenhouse, and um, it's all about south facing and all that stuff and it's partially buried in the ground because what it's using, um, just like um, radiant heating it's using the mass of the ground that gets warm during the day to heat it, keep it at a reasonable temperature at night. And it's really, really cool. Um, this is actually, um, I call it a new technology, but it's all the materials are like old school, right? It's, um, I'm going to put a link in, um, uh, about, about one of the, the, the ones that I was going to buy. Uh, how about that? Maybe I'll do that. Um, but yeah, greenhousing is, we're, we're going to start being able to greenhouse in warmer and warmer climes as um, chocolate is about to go up and many other spices. So what's going to happen is, is most likely is that as these people start increasing, getting a better wage, they get a TV they can afford, um, they're going to want more money for the cocoa or the avocados or all these tropical things that we take advantage of. So it, Oranges were figured out how to how to mass produce farm, but a lot of these are not. We rely on um, cheap labor to get our food cheap on a lot of food, um, and 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 we'll get there uh, with with genius ideas like this. This winter uh, thing. Okay, I'm gonna put on this while I look up um, with these Arctic greenhouses, winter greenhouse, whatever have you. Mr. LeBlanc, seconded by Mr. Sajin, moves for leave to table a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Canada Elections Act. This motion is deemed adopted. Mr. LeBlanc, seconded by Mr. Sajin, moves that this bill be now read a first time and printed. This motion is deemed adopted. This bill, premier lecture, projet de loi. When will this bill be, when will this bill be read a second time? At the next sitting of this house. Statements by ministers. 
reports from interparliamentary delegations. The Honorable Member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since today is March 20th, I would like to wish you happy International Day of the Francophonie. And speaking of la Francophonie, I have the honor to table in this house in both official languages the following report of the Canadian branch of the Assemblée Parlementaire de la Francophonie, Bureau meeting and 48th annual session of the Assemblée Parlementaire in Tbilisi, Georgia from July 4th to 8th, 2023 as well as the 38th session of the APF America Regional Assembly Baton Rouge, Louisiana, USA from September 5th to 7th, 2023, as well as the Francophonie Mission to the United Nations, New York, September 20th, as well as the report of the Canadian branch for the Leadership Workshop for Parliamentarians Women of the APF, Bucharest, Romania from September 25th to 29th, as well as the Working Group on Reforming the APF Constitution, Geneva, Switzerland from November 23rd to 24th, 2023. Thank you. Reports from interparliamentary delegations. Presenting reports from committees. The Honourable Member for Edmonton West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have the pleasure and honour to present in both official languages the 17th report of the Standing Committee on Government Operations and Estimates, also known as the Mighty OGO, entitled The Question of Privilege Concerning the Refusal to Respond to Questions by Mr. Christian Firth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Presenting reports from committees. The Honourable Member for Humber River Black Creek. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. S Madam Speaker, pursuant to Standing Order 1073, I have the honour to present in both official languages the eighth report of the Liaison Committee entitled Committee Activities and Expenditures, April 1st, 2023 to December 31st, 2023. This report highlights the work and accomplishments of each committee as well as detailing the budgets that fund the activities approved by the committee members. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Well done. Well done. Presenting reports from committees. Introduction of private members' bills. Mr. Gerritsen, seconded by Mr. Lamoureux, moves to, uh, for leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Establish Canada's Freshwater Day. This motion is deemed adopted. The Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you. I just want to remind the Honourable Member for New, Mester, New Westminster Burnaby to hold off on his, on his enthusiasm until the Honourable Member actually has an opportunity to speak. The Honourable Member of Kingston and the Islands. It is an honour, Madam Speaker, to introduce uh, the bill entitled An Act to establish a fresh uh, water day in Canada, and I want to thank the enthusiasm of my NDP colleagues on this. Here, here. Uh, having said that, Madam Speaker, while I'm on my feet, I move, seconded by the member from Winnipeg North, that we do now move to orders of the day. Here, here. Oh, haven't seen him in a while. Orders of the day. He's trying to get it forward. And look, looks a little bit like a chaos in there. A lot of the MPs have gone. They've gone to committees. There's a few, a bunch of committees going on. Um, other meetings, I imagine, they're on. And um, maybe a few of them have had to go pay their respect to um, Prime Minister Baruni. Well, Check out the committee the page. Member who his seconder was. I think I missed it, Mr. Lemmer. Okay. Mr. Garretson seconded by. Yeah, uh, check out the community page. Uh, you can see the times and schedules of um, when you can go visit. It, it's it's free, um, and uh, it's like John Arn. You know what I mean? They have it said totally like Game of Thrones, and he is John Arn. And I'm not like exaggerating this. He was like the uh, advisor to like everybody. He just well, you hear all the pundits. They're all like, yeah, he called me. He called me. He called. You know what I mean? Everyone or a lot of these a lot of people had um, were getting their secret advice from this Brian Mulroney, um, former prime minister. And I imagine Pierre, obviously Pierre was, and Trudeau said he was he uh, um, an advisor in his cabinet. So John Arne, our Canada's John Arne. So yeah, you can see the schedule if I uh, check that out. And oh, and uh, Jilly Mack, sorry. Um, yeah, check out that um, one hour link. There's a good hour link on that. It, it's actually, um, if anyone's anybody, and you're getting toward older, um, greenhousing is the future. It's the future. And there, we're going to have little robots take care of it, but greenhousing is the future. Um, we're getting little drones. They're going to be called drones. Little drones are going to do a lot of the, the greenhouse work. Um, but learning the knowledge and getting uh, used to uh, 
the schedule of the seasons, you know, the four seasons and all that, it, it's it's a, a good idea as uh, food is going to be done more locally, which, you know, because we can. We're going to be able to grow, grow oranges or, or up the street. The deer population took a hit in the winter. Hardly left any on my island. Well, wow. uh, here we've been having deer like crazy, but you can't really, you know, caribou have a problem. Um, all right, so that's basically there. I'm going to go. Here's a nice House of Commons stone. Hello. I'm going to see what uh, Duclair, Duclos, Yves Duclos has to say. He's, well, he's taking a grilling. Oh, wait, another vote? Oh, no, they're voting again. Now they're voting again in the House. <laughs> So that's it. Um, all right. That's uh, that's all. There's going to be no committee meeting. They're going to keep on doing the votes. Like, subscribe, and have a fantastic day. Uh, I recommend everybody 